Right, so in a week or so's time, I'm about to embark on the toughest test of my life up to this point. I'm going to be flying halfway across the world. I'm going to be spending pretty much every last penny I have. And the reason for this is to see a professional who hopefully will help me to gain back some of the quality of life that I once had. So what happened to me, to make a long story very short for you, is about seven years ago, just over seven years ago, I very nearly lost my life due to sepsis. And what followed was I needed emergency surgery. I spent a week in a coma. I spent four months in hospital. And during this four months in hospital, I was given three IV antibiotics. And after being given them, during the course of being given them, my life changed completely. Um, I lost 20 kilograms within a month. Um, I was really out of breath and struggling to talk normally. I was struggling to stand up without my heart racing and feeling like I was going to faint. And my digestion just went really strange, like, like my bowels stopped working at times during each day, multiple times during a day. And I ended up with reflux and just lots of air and gas. And yeah, on top of that, I ended up with lots of anxiety, panic, other strange symptoms like temperature dysregulation issues. And seven and a half years later, every single one of those symptoms has stuck by me. And I've done so much to try to alleviate them. I've tried so many options. You know, I've tried different doctors natural conventional I've tried the supplement diet I've tried I'm oh, sorry I've tried the supplement route I've tried dietary changes um, and nothing's worked and nobody can really get to the root cause of what's wrong with me in order to allow me to live independently again because I've been housebound for you know the last seven and a half years so after you know lots of long research and reading a lot of very complex books I eventually came across a condition called dysautonomia, dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system. And it's really difficult to try and break down, but it's basically all the involuntary things your organs do in the body. And it should be sort of seamless. All of it should happen unawares to, you know, your conscious mind. So your heart rate, your digestion, your breathing, uh, temperature regulation. And the best way I'd describe it is if you don't have any issues with your autonomic nervous system, then you never think about it. But if you are somebody who does, then it's pretty much the only thing you can ever think about. And it completely rules your every move of every day, which is what I believe the case has been with me for the last seven and a half years. So eventually, after a lot of deep diving into sort of certain professionals or potential sort of treatment pathways I read a lot of complex books and articles you can see the shortness of breath kicking in while I'm talking to you guys um, and I came across a Dr Nathan Kaiser in Michigan in the States and he helps people with dysautonomia on a very intensive basis so he'll see them at least three times a day Monday to Friday for two to three weeks and in that time he's going to really help to find out where the issue is going on within a brain trauma or brain damage that I've suffered based on that period I was in hospital and all the things I had done to me because that's really where dysautonomia originates from it's damage to part of the brain so the body can no longer self-regulate So yeah, I'm going to be flying over next week. Um, absolutely terrified at the flight, to be honest. If you've sort of been through half of, half of what I've been through over the last decade, you know that, you know, it's quite scary completely going out of your comfort zone. Like I said, I've been housebound for seven and a half years. And so to do this, to live somewhere completely foreign for a month, to live with people that I haven't lived, you know, been living with at all, um, you know, to leave the comfort of a lot of the people I have in my life behind, 
you know, my house, a lot of my family and everything. It's going to be really tough, but I'm, if I'm being completely honest with myself, I need to take this step because I really need at least an acceptable level of quality of life back because it's a struggle. It's just a struggle to live every day, to function every day, um, to have the enthusiasm to sort of, you know, wake up and try to get on with bits and pieces throughout a day. You know, this isn't your sort of bog standard illness where you know you're going to overcome it within a day or two or, you know, maybe a week or two. This is something I told myself when I first experienced the symptoms of it seven and a half years ago. I said to myself, I don't think I'm ever going to feel the same again. And now I've come across an opportunity that I will massively regret if I don't take. And I need to take it. And so what I'm going to do is I'm hopefully going to try my best to document for you along the way how I get on with it all and what Dr. Kaiser has in store for me. And hopefully I'll observe progress along the way. And the tone of this whole video can change and I can really start to almost see the fruits of my labor in terms of the research I've put in, thousands of hours of research I've put in over the last few years, finally pay off. And I really hope to return to the UK and my old self, you know, that's the end goal. That's the ultimate goal. Um, so yeah, I'm going to leave it there for you, but I really hope this works for me because if this works for me, then in turn, I really hope to change the lives of you know, hundreds, thousands of people out there and put them on the best pathway they can be because there's certain symptoms that are really challenging to live with every day and there's a completely different world of people out there that you might not be aware of who suffer really badly every day and, you know, a lot of people are taking their lives very much for granted. So anyway, I'm going to stop rambling. I'm going to try and check in with you when I get the opportunity, I'm going to be absolutely knackered on the day of the flight, so I probably won't record them. But I do want to check in as often as I can. I do want to try to add to this vlog. And yeah, I'm excited to see what's in store. sleep at all last night. Absolutely exhausted. Had tons of symptoms on the plane. But we're very nearly there, so I'm gonna try my best to check in with you guys late this night if I can and not any energy. But yeah, just really relieved so I've almost landed. But proud of myself for that and I really hope this is the start of a brand new adventure for me. So hello from sunny Chelsea in Michigan. So I'm joining you guys the day after the flight. Absolutely exhausted today. I don't really know how I did it yesterday. Um, I think I was just going off adrenaline. Um, had a really bad sleep the day before the flight, of course, because all of this was in my head. Um, and so I really struggled on the day of the flight. Had loads of trap gas. Um, had to go to the airport's uh, toilets and the toilets on the plane so many times throughout yesterday. Um, and just, yeah, I was struggling to breathe on the plane properly because basically the trap gas feels like it pushes against your rib cage and yeah, really uncomfortable, really unpleasant flight. But we left at about 1 p.m. UK time and the flight was eight hours and it all went to plan. So Luckily, we landed here to one of the most incredible sunsets. We're at an absolutely beautiful location. Um, I think it's called Cavanna Lake in Chelsea in Michigan. And yeah, so peaceful, so scenic. Um, you can hear all the wildlife. And I'll have to show you very soon what it actually looks like because it's just, yeah, it's the type of place you want to be when you're feeling fit and healthy which is really where I'm hoping to be by the end of this trip. So the plan for now is to 
spend today, which is Saturday, and tomorrow recovering, ready to see Dr. Kaiser on Monday and see what's in store for me because I'm really looking forward to it. But at the same time, I really don't have any idea what he's got planned for me. Um, I know there's going to be an assessment there. Um, it's going to be hard work. It's going to be no walk in the park. But I'm really looking forward to getting involved and hopefully getting a diagnosis and coming across somebody who actually really knows how to best go about it and the exercises to give to me to get me back to a, you know, a decent quality of life again. And this is just the absolutely best place that it could happen to me because I really want to make the most of it while I'm here because the place is absolutely lovely and I'd just love to um, make this more of a holiday than sort of this uh, treatment trip, if you like. Um, but we'll have to see as the weeks go by. So yeah, I'll check in with you very soon. Next time we'll probably be following his first appointment and um, yeah, hope it all goes to plan. Right, well, what a week that was. So... My original plan was to try to record a clip after every day, after every session with Dr. Kaiser and his team. And yeah, what's ended up happening is because there's so much going on and the days have been quite long, tend to start at about 9 a.m. in the morning and then go through to about 3 or 4 p.m. in the afternoon which is so much more than I've ever pushed my body since I got these really debilitating symptoms. What's ended up happening is I just haven't had time to film. I just haven't had uh, the energy in the evenings because my body has genuinely felt just fulfilled sort of physically. I felt quite exhausted. But yeah, my first day was Monday. I turned up in the morning where I met Dr. Kaiser and his team, um, two lovely ladies called Kelly and Erin. And basically how it started was Dr. Kaiser did a neurological assessment on me. He asked me a few questions about my current symptoms, um, my day-to-day -day life, and what I struggle with the most. And then afterwards, they straight the team there straight away went into some testing, like the tilt table test. Um, there was like a VR headset to check for my eye movements. Um, because the eyes are very closely linked with neurology. So that was all assessed within the first day. So it's fair to say I was absolutely knackered by the end of the day. Um, I thought all these testing bits were going to be separated throughout the week. So the fact that they were all done in one go was just absolutely sort of mind-blowing to me at first. But it was really reassuring because straight away, as soon as I walked into the office there, the, the team were just so validating to my struggles and my symptoms. And actually all three of them that work there have all been through struggles themselves, you know, concussions, heart surgeries. Um, and they've ended up in the past with very unusual, strange symptoms. And they've gone through, you know, all the, the palaver that a lot of us have with going to various different professionals and not really getting any answers and not getting anywhere. So, yeah, that's how it all started with the assessment on the first day. And at the end of the first day, I was shown a presentation with some of the results from the tilt table test and the videography um, of the sort of eye test of my eye movements and whether my eyes actually line up. And, um, and yeah, there were some pretty crazy results on there. Um, but also it was great because it flagged up a fair few things. Um, for example, like my blood pressure and my heart rate going much higher than they should do when I go from uh, lying to standing. My oxygen levels in my head drop by about 20 to 30% more than they should do. The carbon dioxide levels in my head are about 10 to 15% lower than what they should be when I stand up. Um, and then moving on to the eye test, my eyes didn't quite line up and I was not doing so great at some of the uh, tests there. And that has a very um, close neurological link with um, parts of the brain. And in turn, that can affect then your symptoms. 
and parts of your body further on down. Um, so yeah, that was flagged up. And within day two, so straight away, as, as soon as we started day two, oh, also as well, um, I had a misfiring pons, which is part of the brain in the brain stem. Um, so basically my body was always like, it, it, it helps to sort of calm down the body. And over the last seven years, I've never really truly felt relaxed. So that was part of the reason behind me probably feeling like that. Also the right-sided cerebellum. Um, so that part of the brain there, which is sort of um, responsible for your smooth motion of your limbs and your organs sort of movements. Um, you know, the body being able to execute multiple actions at once. So for example, standing up and talking, that's multiple actions at once or talking while you're trying to eat. Some people really struggle with this, like I have from a number of years. So the fact that the cerebellum was flagged up as being dysfunctional or not firing as well as it should be on that side, again, really helped me to understand why I've been struggling so much. So yeah, the day, the first day was from about 9am to 4pm. And then I'm going to summarize the next four days for you because... They were quite similar, but I had other bits going on in between. And really what they're trying to do almost is gradually rehabilitate and strengthen me. And the way Dr. Kaiser does it is he aims to first first stabilize the body and then intru introduce dynamic training later on. So you want to bring everything under control, all the autonomics of the body under control, and that is then when you want to sort of overload the body and train it and increase its endurance so that it's able to handle more. So we started the second day. Um, what we were doing is gradual tilt tables from, we started at 10 degrees. And by the final day, we got up to about 28 degrees. So my body's getting more used to that upright position and my heart rate isn't bouncing as high as it was previously. Um... He's got a full body rotational chair, which helps with vestibular rehabilitation. Again, a very another very important part of the brain um, and can also help with the cerebellum as well. We're doing certain smooth motions like figure eight to um, engage that cerebellum on the right side specifically. Um, training the eyes with multiple different exercises as well. There's one where there's this string with multiple beads on it at different points. I have to try and focus on each bead and um, actually what's really good is they're testing, they've got another test in the office where they're testing the strength of the muscles of my eyes and whether my eyes are aligning as they should be with one another because at first they weren't, my left and right eyes weren't looking at the same target which again is another thing that leads to sort of anxiety and all these other symptoms, all these other symptoms because your body can't properly process what's in front of it. And yeah, as you can probably tell by the way I'm recording this video, I've noticed some changes in the first week already. Um, and yeah, I, I'm just, I'm amazed. You know, we're one week in out of three weeks. It's been physically taxing and Thursday and Friday were the days he pushed me the most. I've done more activity in this last week than I have in the last seven years combined. But it's just amazing to have all my sort of my thoughts validated about my body and why I was struggling and what really the cause might be behind it. And these people seem to get it. They seem to understand it. Um, and I really look forward to week two. So I've noticed changes in the form of, I, I live with an ileostomy, so the stoma output. It's more similar to what it used to be when I was well over seven years back. Um, my energy levels have just basically increased from what they were a lot towards the, the beginning of the week. I feel more relaxed, like I can sit down and actually relax and take in deep breaths and breathe properly without it being interfered. I can talk for longer periods, as you can probably tell me recording this now. I don't feel as full after I'm eating as well, so I don't need to take as long breaks to let the food digest and go down. Um, 
I'm spending longer sitting down in a day like I am at the moment filming this video, but previously I was having to lie on my side probably about 95% of every day. And I reckon a lot of days over the last week, I've actually spent over 50% of the day sat up. So yeah, massive improvements. These might not be big wins for a lot of people out there, but if you're somebody who is like me and you know, you've know you been housebound with a physical ailment for so many years, you understand these wins and you understand just how life-changing it can be. And it seems so far-fetched, but I can really see full recovery in sight. I just need to keep with it. Need to give my body enough time to relax. And yeah, I really hope to be able to build on this progress I've already made because it's it's mind-boggling. You know, in five days I've made more progress than I had the previous seven and a half years. Um, and I finally feel I'm in the right place. But it's taken a lot of hard work to do the research to track down this guy and his team and, and really throw myself in the deep end with it all and, and fly halfway across the world to have this opportunity, which of course I'm very grateful for. So yeah, I'm going to leave it there. Um, really happy, really, really happy. Can't believe it. Um, how I'm just able to sit here and chat with you like this. Five days in, you know, I'm, I'm just blown away and such a beautiful place as I promised I would show you. Um, just back here is where we're staying, the accommodation, little cottage. And how about this? Not bad, hey? So yeah, we've been here a week. And I get to be here another three weeks. So not only is the treatment going well, but yeah, the accommodation's beautiful. The weather on the whole has been really good. And I'm really optimistic. Right, so we've come to the end of my second week of my three-week intensive treatment here in Chelsea, Michigan with Dr. Kaiser and his team. So as you would know, if you've watched the video up to this point, I came here with plenty of autonomic issues, um, sluggish digestion, very fast heart rate when standing, high blood pressure when standing, uh, temperature dysregulation problems, shortness of breath. And I was really hoping that a lot of these issues would either resolve or just go in the right direction since I arrive here and over the course of the three weeks that I'm actually seeing the team here. And at the end of week one, I noticed a lot of improvement. Um, week two has been a bit varied. Week two has had lots of positives. Week two has also had a lot of my old symptoms creeping back in, which it does scare you. It does scare you, especially when you feel like you've got a limited time with somebody. And even when I arrive back home in the UK, I'll be having regular check-ins with Dr. Kaiser and his team to see how I'm getting on. And they'll also be prescribing me certain neurological exercises to partake in when I'm back home. So they'll be monitoring me closely to make sure that I'm doing okay. But pretty much the, the day after that I spoke on my last video, so that was the Saturday last week, um, on that Saturday, I made the video of course, and then I went on a video call with my mum mum and my sister. Um, and the Sunday morning, I did a fair amount as well. And when we were out in the uh, supermarket, kind of about 15 minute drive from here, we came back and it was just ridiculously hot. I think it was like 28 degrees. Um, and I started noticing tightness in my abdomen and that just led to sort of panic, um, you know, like a closed chest where I felt I couldn't breathe properly, just felt nauseous, felt like I was gonna faint or pass out. So I had that issue on the Sunday and then Monday wasn't so bad, but I felt a pressure building in my body, especially on the left side of my body, throughout the entirety of Tuesday. And right by the end of the session on Tuesday, I ended up having a nosebleed. So it was almost like the pressure had ended up relieving itself. Um, and it's just throughout the week, I've been having issues with my digestion. I'm actually really exhausted today because yesterday, Friday, I was worked super hard in Dr. Kaiser's office 
And then he invited me along to <clears throat> come and see the uh, local team, the Chelsea Bulldogs, playing a football match. So I didn't know whether I was going to turn up or not. In the end, I ended up turning up for about two quarters of the game. Um, and yeah, I struggled quite a bit when I arrived. The weather conditions were just pretty horrendous. It was windy, raining, cold. Um, but I met up with him there and it was really good just to just take in the experience because never seen an American football game before. Um, but yeah, I really struggled with my digestion and just feeling really cold when I was there. So I've had about three or four incidents this week where my old symptoms have crept in. And that's really the bad for me of this week. However, I have been worked harder this week. And this is what Dr. Kaiser was telling me. It's like he's trying to push the boundary a bit with me this week a little bit further because he knows he's got the third week with me. So he, sort of want, he wants to observe what's going on with my body, seeing how well I'm responding, seeing how well I'm bouncing back. And to be honest, just the fact that I'm being able to check in with you today on this video and talk like this, I'm knackered, I'm out of breath, I didn't sleep very well, but I wouldn't have been able to do this at all back home before this had all started. So I'm starting to sort of notice some improvements, especially with from the beginning of this week to the end, sorry, from the beginning of last week to the end of last week, so from the Monday to Friday. I was sat down and standing up more during a day, which is just, you know, a massive thing for me because prior to this trip, I was probably spending 90 to 95% of my day laying on the floor. Um, I've gone for little walks around some of the local shops. There's the Chelsea Bulldog merch store. There's um, a comic book store around the corner from his office. There's also a nice little courtyard that we've walked to a couple of times. So I've been able to get out and about a bit more. Um, feel a bit more restless when I'm sat down like I want to move around which is obviously a really good thing um, we've been having progress on the tilt table as well so when I had my original tilt on the test I went up to 70 degrees I think my blood pressure just spiked and my heart rate went up to about 125 beats per minute and now we've got up to almost 60 degrees and my heart rate isn't going above 10 beats per minute faster than when I'm flat so if I'm flat and it's, say, 65, it's not going above 75. So that's just great progress. Um, yeah, something I'm, you know, really happy with, really proud of. That alone has made the trip worthwhile. If I can get it to the point where I feel comfortable standing up, then that would just, you know, that would be a massive achievement for, you know, my recovery, a massive sort of step in the right direction. The digestion, on the other hand has been an issue. Um, it's been an issue frequently throughout this week. And on Friday, Dr. Kaiser actually did this sort of test on me where he got me lying flat on the tilt table and he sort of lifted the bottom half of my shirt up and he, he, he rubbed coconut oil on my stomach sort of around where I'd had my surgery because I've had three abdominal surgeries. And he noticed like a red mark come up when he was sort of rubbing my skin. And he said that that was most likely quite a lot of scar tissue and scarring from the original operation and what that really um, hinders is digestive motility and actually that movement of the digestive system and he was sort of pushing my abdomen one way and it was moving freely and freely and the other way when he pushed it it was like it wouldn't go that way so I've definitely got some sort of obstructions something blocking the mobility of my intestines and in turn, that's leading to a lot of symptoms and a lot of problems for me. So he got this like blunt knife tool and he started doing like this massage where he's trying to break up the scar tissue. My impression is that he's hopefully going to do that more often next week. It might even be a thing where he tells me to do it myself when I end up going home because I don't think it's going to be a really quick fix. But hopefully if we can deal with that, along with the orthostatic intolerance and get me standing up properly again, and, you know, improving again with things like, you know, the shortness of breath. Yes, I'm a bit short of breath today, but I had a really tiring day yesterday and I didn't sleep well at all. So if all these things can improve gradually, then I'll be really, really happy that I've made the journey, you know, for this trip. And to be honest with you already, I feel like it's been worth it. Um, you know, when I think about when I arrived here, I am still struggling. 
you know, I am still getting symptoms. I won't lie to you. And this week has been tough. I've had more symptoms this week than I did the last week. But we are going in the right direction. He is pushing me harder. And I'm just really hoping that, you know, this third week is really a turning point where I, I start to feel like I can stand up for much longer. I start to notice less digestive symptoms. You know, that motility just runs smoothly without me even being aware of it. Hopefully it's something that will end up improving and it will allow me to have my final week in Chelsea, which is after the three weeks here. It will allow me to enjoy myself a bit more in terms of, you know, making this a bit more of a holiday where I can actually go places and spend days out because, you know, last night when I turned up to the, the football game, I turned up but I was in considerable discomfort and whilst I appreciated taking in the experience it was just a lot to even be there and sort of concentrate on the event because I, I did feel a lot of pain and a lot of discomfort so yeah that's the week two check-in um, end of week two at the moment they've still got me doing similar things there so they're gradually increasing the tilts on the tilt table to um, improve my barrow receptor sensitivity so that I don't have such a high heart rate when going from a lying to standing position and that's working really well I'm responding really well to that um, still getting sort of still doing certain eye exercises there spending plenty of time in the red light room to you know get pl plenty of light on my body and you know that should help with sort of mitochondrial and energy production um, you know having this massage now on my stomach to try and break up the scar tissue while we're doing these you know while we're doing these other therapies um, I'm also in the kind of full body rotation chair, so that helps with re uh, vestibular rehab. Um, again, feeding into another very important pathway of the brain. And this is just basically trying to stabilize my body so that hopefully, once it's stable, we can build on that point and we can really start to introduce dynamic retraining and you know really improving my endurance and my strength and my stamina. So yeah, really looking forward to this third week. It's been quite a tough second week, I'm not going to lie to you. This is probably one of the toughest things I've, I've ever done in my life. But I had to do it and I said at the very start of this video that I would regret not doing this. And now I'm here, I definitely don't regret it. But I would like to see, hopefully, some more changes in this final week. But again, I'll report back to you. Hopefully, it will go smoothly, but we'll have to see. So until then, see you soon. Okay, so I'm joining you at the end of the third and final week of my treatment here in Chelsea, Michigan, in Dr. Kaiser's clinic and with his team. Wow, guys, what a week it's been. What a week it's been. I've done so much this week. Um, yeah, I can't believe it, really. Um, I remember when I ended the video last week, at the end of week two, and I was really apprehensive I was really unsure of whether I was going to make as much of a recovery as I'd really hoped for coming into this. And when I turned up to Dr. Kaiser's clinic on the Monday last week, he said he could see it in my pupils when he was assessing me right at the start of the week that all of this was on my mind, the fact that I might not make as much of a recovery as I'd hoped for. Um... So yeah, again, we continued with a lot of the similar exercises this week. Um, but something was different on Monday. Um, I felt an urge to want to exercise my body to really get my heart rate going. Um, so at the end of the day on Monday, I started on a stepping machine. Um, it's at about a 45 degree angle. And it's quite high intensity, but I had it at a low resistance. And I set the machine for 10 minutes, which was very ambitious. And he said if I lasted any more than a minute or so, that it would be really positive. And I lasted for six minutes on the Monday. And then again on Tuesday, I did the same thing. I lasted for seven minutes. On Thursday, I lasted for nine minutes. And then to cap off the week on Friday, I upped the resistance and managed 10 minutes on the machine. And what was really exciting about Thursday and Friday is the fact that 
when I got to nine and 10 minutes on the machine, I actually started sweating, sweating while exercising, which is the first time that that's happened to me while exercising in probably about eight years. Every time I've tried exercising between now and then, I've just got a panicky feeling. I've got this sort of electrical sort of frazzly feeling in my face and in my chest and the skin on my arms. And yeah, it feels like you sort of want to throw up, but you can't throw up. And it's just a very, very uncomfortable feeling. And your body feels like it shouldn't be exercising. So yeah, super positive. Um, in between the sessions at the clinic as well, I noticed that they were giving me slightly longer breaks. I don't know whether they were doing that intentionally or not. But what that allowed me to do was to wander out a little bit more, to be a bit more ambitious, wander down the high street and wander into some of the coffee shops and the cafes. So during this week, I've been to two separate cafes on two different occasions each. Um, I've been to the local merch store, um, the Chelsea Bulldog store a couple of times. And then actually outside of the days here, We've um, gone for a couple of shops at supermarkets, three times, three separate places. We've gone on a little drive out, once to Walmart, once to Country Market, and once to a place called Maya as well. Um, and each of the time I've been walking around there, I've probably managed about between 15 and 20 minutes on my feet before going in the wheelchair because at the end of the day, this is a long-term process and I've barely been on my feet for the last seven years, so... You don't just sort of click your fingers and, you know, you're back on your feet and you can walk for, you know, multiple hours in a day. It's a very gradual process. And when I consider I'm putting that on top of the treatment that I'm already carrying out at Dr. Kaiser's clinic, I'm doing an awful lot in a day. And one of the biggest positives I've seen really is the fact that even with these very stressful, tiring days, I'm able to bounce back the next day and go again you know, show up every day. And yes, I do still get symptoms every now and then, and the symptoms are being explained to me. But a lot of the symptoms are also expected because when you push your body, it just happens with anyone. You know, you, if you think about exercise and you tire, you get muscle aches. The same with the systems in the body that um, are involved with functional neurology as well. If you haven't exercised a certain system so long and it's been damaged or it's been sort of under-trained, You've got to gradually rehabilitate it and you're going to get some symptoms along the way. So yeah, really, really happy. Um, yesterday I went out in the morning to a cafe. The weather was really bad. It was very busy, very crowded. Lots of noise, lots of people, so many triggers. There was probably about 30 triggers in that cafe that would have got me sort of on the, on the lookout for you know ways to escape. And I managed to sit with it. And we were in there enjoying a hot drink and a little bit of food for 20, 25 minutes before walking up the high street, getting back in the car and going to a place called Ceramics Clayland because as a little kind of parting gift, a little present, we've bought the two ladies that have helped my rehabilitation. A couple of vases that we've painted and so we've had to drop them back off at the kiln. And then we came back here, was on a video call with my family back home. Um, and then in the evening we went out to Maya, um, the supermarket, and it was probably the longest time I'd been on my feet. And I definitely felt it a bit on, on, uh, the car journey back home. And this morning I've woken up a little bit out of breath. I'm not going to lie, but you know, we go again. Um, like I said, this isn't a three week fix. If you want to commit to these type of exercises, you've got to be in it for the long term and I'm shortly being going to be sent through an email containing lots of the exercises that they want me to continue daily when I arrive back home. And actually, I've set up uh, some of them in this house already that we're staying at um, so that I can basically have that momentum when I go back home next week because I've got another week here in Chelsea. So that would be a real test to see if I can maintain this level of health and this fitness and really build on it because... It is a little bit concerning sometimes when you're being so intensely assessed and monitored by healthcare professionals and then suddenly you cut that cord and you're on your own. 
But what's really good about the team here is that they're going to give me those exercises and they're going to also have regular checkup and video calls with me once I return home. So it's not just that, you know, you leave here and then they don't want anything to do with you. They really do care about your ongoing recovery and how you're going to get on when you get back home. So yeah, just so many positives to report this week. So many of the symptoms have improved. Digestion's returned back to how it was the first week, even though I'm doing even more, which is just absolutely bizarre. Less shortness of breath, um, just more energy. I'm more on my feet. Less like aroused in certain situations where I feel sort of triggered by environments. Um, you know, like I was saying before about in cafes and stuff, I'd get panicky. I'd want to leave straight away. And I don't feel that as much. I feel calm. I feel like I can stop and just sort of slow down and appreciate the environment I'm in and not want to rush to escape anything. Um, yeah, as I said, walking around, just being on my feet, also being sat up. I mean, let's not forget when I arrived here, I was lying on my side probably for about 90 to 95% of every day. And now it's like, I mean, what, 10, maybe 15 minutes a day. If I've really exhausted myself, I'll be lying on my side. If not, I'm sat up or standing and walking around, which is just incredible. I mean, seven and a half years every day I had these symptoms. That's like what about 2000 days and then within a span of 21 days three weeks it's just improved like an extraordinary amount in every single symptomatic department and i'm so grateful for the team here that compassion is just on another level and just their faith in me and their approach to their treatment their enthusiasm behind it um i've never met people in the world like it especially in healthcare and you know to really focus on wanting to strengthen the body when you're unwell not weaken it not give you things not surgeries not meds just identify the areas of the problem and then work on them and train them gradually and recondition them so yeah this isn't going to be the end of the vlog but this is going to be the end of the week three update Hopefully, I plan to make a couple more videos while I'm here. But until then, guys, it's all been positive from me. I really hope this continues, and I'll see you again very soon. Okay, so I'm very grateful to be joined today by Dr. Erin Kipros at Dr. Kaiser's clinic here in Chelsea, Michigan. Erin, firstly, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate your time. So talk to me today. Um, wow, what a three weeks it's been after seven over seven years of just ongoing suffering, pain, and symptoms. It feels like it's been a real sort of roller coaster of physical kind of symptoms, but also an emotional roller coaster across these three weeks because there's times where I feel like I'm taking two steps forward, I'm taking one step back with some of the symptoms feels like I'm really pushing my body, getting excited about where I can go to. And then it's reminding me of how I've lived for the past seven years. But on the whole, it's been an amazing journey. And from when I arrived at the beginning to sort of when I left, you know, a week or so ago from your care, I've just been able to do so much more in such a short space of time. So I wanted to firstly ask you um, what you thought about my mental and physical state when I arrived at the clinic on the first day? I think when you arrived it was obvious that you were a little nervous, which most people are when they're coming to do testing like this. Most people it's not the first place they've been to. You've been through a lot to get to here to begin with, so going through your story again, going through all the testing is nerve-wracking. Mm -hmm. and. It was obvious that just being upright, like in the position mm, you are now, mm, mm. was not something that was usual no. <laughs> for you. And the first day's hard. Like yeah. the first day is designed to test you a little bit and yeah. put you into positions yeah. and do yeah. tests that are supposed to make you feel uncomfortable. And they did. They did. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I was. Well, I was going to ask about the tests actually because mm -hmm. there was a lot on that first day. But what was it ex exactly you were testing for? Because I had the original neuro neurological assessment from Dr. Kaiser, mm -hmm. 
and then we went into the room with the tilt table and then the VOR headset. If we start with the tilt table, what is it exactly you're looking for when you're doing that tilt table and what did my results in particular reveal to you? So we're looking, we're trying to look at how your system responds globally to basically different stressors that you would experience in your life, which includes like an orthostatic stressor or taking you up to 78 degrees mm -hmm. of tilt, right? So we connect you to a whole bunch of different things that yeah. we use to monitor. So we use the 3 lead EKG, so we can see what's going on with your heart, blood pressure cuffs, which we do on your lower and your upper extremity. We use the oxygen saturation. We also do the cannula so we can mm -hmm. measure the end tidal carbon dioxide and then as well as the two ultrasound probes so that we can actually measure the blood flow velocity yeah. that's going up to your head while we're doing the tilt. So the purpose for us is to not to just look at one aspect of what's going on when you do a tilt table mm. or when you do deep breathing or when you do one of those Valsalva tests. It's what's going on with the system as a whole yeah. so we can put the pieces together and see how it all actually connects. Yeah, yeah. and I've seen quite a few people on the tilt table test before, but I've never actually seen somebody with the, is it transcranial Doppler, the, yes. the sort of headset? And what exactly was that measuring? The blood flow? Blood flow velocity. The yeah. Velocity. So we, what we do is we use the two probes right in front of your ear right here. Yeah. So you have your middle cerebral artery that comes off the carotids that come up and supply the anterior portion of your head. Mm -hmm. So when we think about doing a tilt or changing from like a supine lean down position to up, Gravity hits you and it pulls that yeah. blood down. Yeah. So our body should have the compensations to recognize that and then change blood pressure, heart rate, constriction in order to keep the blood flow in your head. Yeah. When you went up, your body wasn't compensating <laughs> for that change very yeah. well. And we could see that the velocity of blood that was going up into your head dropped yeah. when you went into that position. We think about people who don't feel great being upright. Mm -hmm. It's hard to feel great and run things the way they're supposed to in your brain if it's not getting the blood and the fuel that it needs. Yeah, yeah. And so we, I think we spoke later in the day about the results from the tilt table, how actually when I got tilted up, my oxygen concentration in my head, or my blood flow to my head mm -hmm. dropped to around between, I think it was 65 to 70 or something like that. So that was about probably 20%, at least 20% lower than it should have been. Right. And also the carbon dioxide levels were about 26, 27%. And ideally they shouldn't be, is it below 35%? Yeah, so we want them to be within 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury, which is the unit that we use for that end tidal carbon dioxide. So yes, when you went up, we would like within the first minute, your blood flow to stay basically above 90%. And then in subsequent minutes of a 10 minute tilt, we want it to stay above 80%. Right. Dropping below that means mm -hmm. that you're having a greater than 20% drop of blood yeah. up to the head, yeah. right, which we don't want to see. And then that carbon dioxide level, we use it as a proxy to how much carbon dioxide is in your blood. So if we think about the sensors in your head that are monitoring how much carbon dioxide is going through, if you have a lot of carbon dioxide, the body recognizes that we need to expel that and you have dilation of the vessels. Right. But when you have low, uh -huh. the body doesn't rec recognize that there's not as much, so you can have constriction. So someone who's mm -hmm. already not getting a ton of blood, blood up to the head, and then is sensing low amounts of carbon dioxide and having constriction, those are both working against you. And it's really interesting as well you said about constriction, because it's like I've had problems with sort of the colouring of my skin I've noticed over the last seven years where my hands turn very purple, my feet turn a very purple colour. That's almost like the blood being constricted and pushed to sort of the peripheral, peripheral of the body. And then also, you know, sort of I'm renowned for having digestive issues. I've had three, um, you know, intestinal surgeries. And a lot of that has to do with the constriction as well, doesn't it? So it's not just a situation of you know, problems with, with standing upright. It's all other systems in the body, all other symptoms. And as a result, you end up getting diagnosed with lots of different conditions when really it's just that problem. And really what's going on is it's almost like the body is compensating, isn't it? Because it's always trying to sort of serve you as best it can. And if you're forcing yourself to stand up, it, it needs to, in whatever way possible, to get blood up to the head. And then that probably comes to the detriment detriment of everything else that's exactly. in the body. Yeah. yeah, and if you're not 
getting blood up from your head through proper constriction to push it up through your blood pressure, your body's going to do the next best way, which is increase heart rate mm. to try to get mm. it to go Yeah, up. and we saw a lot of that as well. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, the heart went from, I don't know what it was, 75, 80 beats per minute. I think it was up to about 125 beats per minute. So mm -hmm. ideally you're looking at what, maybe less than 10 beats change in an ideal human. Yeah, so we should, you should have, you can have a little bit of change when you go up, right? The body's compensation for a change, it has to respond to that, you're going to do that, but then it should be able to level itself after. Mm. So seeing that large percentage change usually is a compensation for something, some other system not kicking on yeah. the way yeah. it should. The more ideal system that should right. be employed. Or just the way the system works together. If two things aren't communicating mm -hmm. the way they're supposed to, we're going to have like a miscommunication. Yeah. One thing's going to have to take over where the other wasn't functioning yeah. the way yeah. it should. And so does the, the VOR headset test, is that linking closely into like a similar system? Is that one of these other systems that we should be monitoring? So what, what was it that you were checking for when doing that test? Yeah, so we use like a video aquiography set that monitors your eye movements when we put you through a whole series of tests. Ours is pretty long. Yeah. So we make you yeah. about 20 yeah, minutes, yeah. 20 minutes worth of testing. But a big thing we think about when doing something like that, and it ties back to the tilt table test is if you're not getting blood flow to your head, how well do you think your eyes, your brain, and then subsequently your eyes are mm. going to be moving? Mm -hmm. So we have lots of people that come in that says, oh, I've done all these, visual therapies or all these eye trainings and it hasn't made a difference and then we put them on a tilt table and see they're not keeping any blood in their head mm. so it's are you getting the fuel to be able to do the exercise that's going to help and yeah. allow you to see the improvement yeah. right it's like trying to run a car without putting any gas in it mm. we have to kind of have one that comes before yeah. the other so when we look at the visual system through the video aquiography we're looking at can your eyes hold a target? Can your eyes stay still when they're in the dark? Can your eyes move smoothly when they're tracking a target? Can your eyes move quickly when they're jumping back and forth? Do you have reflexes intact? So that's when all the stars go by and you mm. see those optokinetic reflexes. And then we also look at things like your reaction time to stimuli and then your subjective visual vertical. Where do you think straight yeah. up and straight down yeah, is yeah. because we know a lot of systems come into play when it comes to our visual system and our inner ear and then mm. our neck and our head yeah. of knowing where we are in space and actually making sure that when we transition yeah. our body knows where we actually are and can adapt properly to that okay brilliant so i'm guessing from the findings of both the tilt table and the, the vor headset that you you, know, you picked up on a lot of these variables and very quickly that was done within a single day and it's fair to say I was absolutely exhausted by the end <laughs> of the first day um, but it was surprising to me that straight away when we moved on to day two um, we started with neurological exercises we started with the recovery process really um, what systems in the body were you focusing on to begin with to try to stabilize in my situation so I think the first exercise with you we did was the laying down and we were just passively rotating your head and keeping your gaze steady on a target. So we were basically using your vestibular ocular reflex. So using your vestibular system, which was pretty intact, mm -hmm. which we found during the testing to allow you to better hold onto a target. So we're basically just trying to stabilize that system first so that you knew where you are and your visual system was adequately getting information about where you are so that when we started to move you into different positions, more upright, more down, that we had a strong foundation using that system in order to do it. Okay, and then so we moved later on to, we were doing gradual tilts, weren't we? Mm -hmm. So it's interesting with the tilt table how on the first day you tilted me up to 70 degrees, I had this drastic spike in heart rate. I had an increase in blood pressure as well at the time. But gradually we were doing, what, five to 10 degree increments like daily over the period of a few weeks. What are we training when we're doing that? How does that help for me to then be able to deal with orthostatic intolerance and this inability to stand upright? 
So you have, kind of we talked about the receptors in your body that allow you to know where you are in space, right? So those come from your eyes. So when we were doing these, you were also a lot of the times focusing on a target mm. so that you could keep your eyes knowing where you were. And then we would use input from your neck as well. So your baroreceptors sense the pressure change that's coming in through your neck and where you are in space. So basically what we're doing is we're training those mm -hmm. like exercise. Yeah. So yeah. just giving them more and more practice of I can adequately sense where I am and respond yeah. to that in a proper way. And at first it's I can sense that I'm at five degrees and I can get the body to respond properly when I'm at five degrees. And then it's just keeping on going. If I can do it at yeah. 10 degrees, yeah. I can do it at 20. And eventually you can do it further and further. So it's a bit like saying, like if you were to relate it to like uh, going to the gym situation, for me, lying on the floor flat was my comfortable position. But if I were to stand up to a hundred, uh, sorry, if I were to stand upright, it would be like, say, lifting a hundred pounds as the first weight you were lifting. Maybe you should start with 20 pounds, 25 <laughs> and gradually build up that way. It's so, so it's a similar thing to training a muscle really. It's just you're training it to respond appropriately in small increments so that you don't over push the body. You don't sort of exhaust the body's resources. Yeah, exactly. It's and exactly like you said, like lifting weight, you would never go from never working out into your entire life to the next day running a marathon yeah, and think yeah. that you were going to be successful in yeah. that. And then when you go to the gym, maybe you went and you lifted 25 pounds one day, but if you never went back and lifted it again, you wouldn't be able mm. to maintain that, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's just repetition and getting the body used to doing it and used to doing it properly more and more and more mm. times so that you can build that system within your neural networks and your brain, mm. and then your body just knows how to do it yeah, down yeah. the line. So other than the tilt table, we did um, the full body rotational chair. Mm -hmm. When I was locking onto a target, we were doing the bead string, again, locking onto more targets. As you said before, the gradual head rotation, there was a lot of exercises involving the eyes. And I'm really interested to know, because I think from a lot of people I've spoken to who are interested about potentially trying to recover, the eyes are something I've never heard brought up at all. Are the eyes very important? Are they a window for you to know how, or well, to assess how our body's doing through when we arrive first in the clinic and how we're performing each day with these exercises? Is it really important to train them? Yes, so that's <laughs> definitely one of the, I don't think we have very many people that come to the clinic that we don't do some sort of visual or ocular mm. training mm. with. Most of our therapies have some sort of yeah. aspect of that going on. So if we think about the way our eyes work, and you kind of alluded to it, that it's a window to the brain, your eyes are so intimately connected with your brain and different areas of your brain can control different actions of your eyes. So we can get a good idea of what part of the brain might be functionally functioning optimally and what area might be functioning less optimally based on how your eyes do different things, how they move, how they hold, if they have a drift, right? If they can't hold things, if they move quickly when they're supposed to be still, mm. that gives us a better picture of where in the brain we might be seeing things not functioning. And also optimally. pupil size as well. That has quite a big link to the autonomics, doesn't it, in the body? Yes. So I noticed that was something you were checking along the way as well. Maybe if I was sort of fatiguing during certain exercises. Mm -hmm. Also, the on the first day, um, Dr. Kaiser got me doing the Matics rod test, uh, which I don't think I <laughs> performed brilliantly at. I believe I think one of my eyes just about stayed on the. So there's a light in the middle of a piece of paper, mm -hmm. and you sort of, you kind of hold this. It's almost like a red lens with a line through it. Yes. And so you stand about, know, 20, 20, feet. about 20 feet away from the bit of paper. And so if, you're, if the line, you, you do one eye at a time, and if the line is through the middle of the paper for both of your eyes, then it means your eyes are seeing the same target. They're locked exactly. onto the same target. And I think my first test, my right eye was off the page to the left, <laughs> and my left eye was on the number five on the right. So they were you know, five to probably eight inches off the target from what they were seeing. So, you know, can completely understand why we 
then employed so many of these eye training exercises and yeah no, I think it's made a massive difference I even noticed when I was filming the video before and watching it back I believe my eyes look a lot more central before they looked like one of them was wandering off a little bit so it's weird thinking that these eye exercises again like you said it's like working a muscle but there are actual sort of muscles that we're training aren't they mm -hmm. with the eyes as well so it's <laughs> super interesting <laughs> and um so when I came in to see you at the clinic, I came in three, for three weeks in a row, but on a very intensive basis. I came in for three sessions a day, five days a week, three weeks in a row. Why is it so important to you and the rest of the team here to see me on such an intensive basis as opposed to there's a lot of clinicians out there that will give you something to do, it might be an exercise or whatever they give you to do, and they don't see you again for another half a year or a year, however long it might be. You see, you've seen me multiple times every day for three weeks in a row. Why is it so important to you to do that? So the first thing is, and this is kind of the cool thing about the brain and specifically what we do, is if you think about how long it would take to repair an, a sprained ankle, Right, we're talking about soft tissue. Mm -hmm. The length of time for that is significantly longer for those changes to be made. The length of time that it takes for us to make new neural connections or change neurologically mm -hmm. what's going on is much, much shorter. So the more we can do that and the more we can put that together in a shorter amount of time, the greater change we can make in a shorter amount yeah. of time. And yeah. when people have been struggling for years and years and years we want to get that dial moving as quickly as we possibly can yeah. because it can be defeating yeah. for people who struggled with these things for so so long and then they go to an appointment and it's all right let's check in in another six months mm. that's another mm. six months of not being sure if what you're doing is helping and things yeah. like that yeah. we can see you in a shorter period of time we know we can check more regularly and make sure that what we're doing is actually making a difference. So we had little checks and things that we would do pretty much every day yeah, to make sure we yeah. were seeing objective improvements in the measures we were looking mm, at. Yeah. And then just for you to be able to see that dial start to change. Everything's yeah, not yeah. gonna be 100% yeah. at the end of that three weeks when you've been struggling with something for seven years, yeah, right? Yeah but it's a lot easier to see that change in that short amount of time and then be confident and have the evidence going home that you can continue mm. to progress rather than to drag that out for longer and longer periods. Yeah, and I also noticed as well, um, it's really nice, although you were seeing me three times a day, which seems like an awful lot, actually there was breaks in between. And I think, I don't know whether it was done tactically or not, but as the weeks went on, it felt to me like the breaks were a little bit longer and that gave me almost more of an incentive to wander a little bit more outside the clinic and sort of have a bit more curiosity of what's down the high street. You know, can I sit in a cafe? Can I feel relaxed? Can I come back to the clinic and perform the exercises as well? And it made me feel more comfortable as well, knowing that if I pushed my body maybe a little bit too far, you know, I would come back here and you guys would monitor, you maybe check the pupils, you would put the uh, pulse oximeter on and sort of see some of the changes and whether what I was doing was actually, you know, sort of helping me or whether I was tiring and maybe need to dial back the exercises for that day. But no, it's yeah, super, you know, helpful. And yeah, I've just never come across a clinic before that offers that intensity, but yeah, no, it really is sort of, you know, it really did work very well. Um, so what changes did you note in me, both from a clinical perspective where we were doing a lot of these sort of, you know, the tilt table, a lot of the, you know, eye exercises and everything. So what changes did you note in me, both clinically and perhaps in sort of my demeanor, my personality from day one to when I left the clinic in week three? Yeah. So I think if we started with just your ability to be upright 
for significantly longer periods of time. Like we were able to measure that objectively by re-putting the Doppler on you and seeing that mm, we could tilt mm. you up significantly higher yeah. without you losing that blood flow up into your head. But then also just your ability to, on your breaks, like you said, go for walks or just be sitting up front instead of when you first started mm. having to lay down yeah. or being able to do 10 minutes worth of exercise right yeah, yeah that's a big difference in that your ability to be upright and function upright and speak when you're upright and do all of these different yeah. things we also saw a good amount of improvement in the stability of your eyes as well right yeah. you being able to hold on to a target and having both eyes look at that target at the exact same spot and hold on to it without having any jerks or square wave jerks yeah. in your eyes and we progress to you doing that, like laying down while someone moves your head, to you doing it in the whole body rotation, and now it's something that you could do at your home where you're sitting mm, upright mm. and doing it mm. all on your own while keeping that gaze. Yeah, I've already it's set stable. up some of the exercises back at the cottage because of course we're here for another week. And yeah. Something must have kind of gone right as well because I had that, that urge to want to exercise and actually sort of on my week off, if you like, I'd sort of come into the clinic and I've used the sort of stepping machine and feel, I feel really good doing it and you know I push the boat out a bit because after my sort of longer days at the clinic especially during week three mm -hmm. we went out to a few different supermarkets it's like I was doing more physical activity on top of the very sort of you know both physical and mental and sort of all the brain power you needed to use whilst you were here for the days yeah. I was taking that into the evenings and then one thing that was really important to me was the fact that I was actually able to bounce back and go again the next day because I was sort of renowned for you know doing stuff in a day and crashing and being sort of lied out on the floor for two, three days, half a week to a week before I decided to do something again the day after. So you know before I could do the next phys physical activity. So yeah, no, it was a huge change. And just how important is it? You were talking about these exercises that I've been doing in the clinic and of course now that I've been discharged if you like I've been given these exercises to do back at home as well just how important is it for me or anyone who comes in and goes through the whole process how important is it for us to stick with these exercises because you know it's all great that we've had three weeks here and I've made a considerable considerable amount of progress is it really important to stick with the exercises what would happen if I perhaps so sort of slacked off in that department. Yeah, I think you can just relate it to going back to the gym. Yeah. Right. If you stop going, you're probably not going to be as strong as you'd like to be, or you yeah. were when you were going. That being said, it's not our goal that every single person has to do these exercises for the rest of their life, mm. forever mm. and ever. Things are going to progress and change, and what you need to be doing in order to keep yourself healthy might change over the next couple weeks, couple months years going forward so the exercises we give at the beginning are very important for you to continue to do more frequently at the beginning especially as you transition to doing them in the clinic which is a very controlled environment to going back to doing them at home which yeah. might have different variables different stressors all sorts of thing that plays a part it's important to do them very frequently at the beginning so that you can keep up and do you that. often find as well with um, patients how they perhaps go away with the exercises they really focus on them and then the positive improvement that that brings that could then cause them to almost forget a little bit about the exercise because they're they don't realize they're probably enjoying life a bit more than they ever had done and they've got to sort of focus more and think about those exercises every now and then and stick with them. Yeah, and we love to hear that too is that at the beginning it's I have to do my exercises so that I don't feel this way yeah. and then all of a sudden it's oh my gosh I haven't felt that way mm, mm. and you're realizing that you can do so much more without even having to think about what it was that was causing you yeah. the problem yeah. in the first place and that's the goal right it goes from doing the exercises every single day to make it the priority right it's mm. the way your body just automatically yeah. it becomes automatic in your body and then it's eventually okay I can do the exercises a little bit less or maybe I have to do a different exercise to continue to improve an area that might be progressing a little bit slower or differently from the other things and we help with that too mm. 
once you kind of leave the actual clinic environment, we yeah. keep in touch with you. And if there's something that is not continuing to progress the way you want it to, we can change up exercises for home and things like that as well. And I've had a lot of people ask about sort of what I've had done here and how I would describe the environment. And I don't know whether you put it in this same sort of terminology, but I sort of see this place a little bit like a gym, but maybe a brain gym. Is that how yeah. you would consider it as well? Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like coming and you're doing work and you're doing exercise, but it's different from the exercise you do when you go to yeah. the gym. It's more yeah. neurological, right? Yeah. So sometimes you also think, well, how hard can it be to just sit there and yeah. look yeah. and keep my eyes focused on something? But it is. It it's is really hard, hard yeah. work when you come in and it makes a really big difference when you come in and you're willing to put that yeah. work Yeah, in. sure. Um, so you experienced a concussion, was it just over a decade ago, a little bit longer? Yeah, probably about 10 years ago. Yeah, so of course you must have gone through the recovery process yourself of trying to find answers going to different practitioners and I was just wondering whether functional neurology and what we're sort of surrounded by, what we're sort of partaking in, what you're practicing as well, whether that helped at all with your own recovery. With For that. sure. That's probably the thing that I credit my recovery okay. to, is finding a functional neurologist or a chiropractic neurologist that was able to help me, because I had been to a lot of different other medical professionals, mm -hmm. including traumatic brain injury centers and hospitals and things right. like that. Yeah. And then luckily through Kind of similar to you, basically just through looking things up mm -hmm. and being able to find something online, I found a chiropractic neurologist who didn't do all the testing that we do here, but was able to look at my eyes and was able to look at how I was functioning and address those specifically by giving me little exercises to do and things to do like that. And I was able to significantly decrease the symptoms. Mm -hmm. And what were those symptoms? Having. So I had a lot of, originally I couldn't form words, so I wasn't able to talk or put sentences together after my concussion. I had a lot of depression type symptoms. Yeah. And then fatigue was a big one for me. Major, major headaches that would completely take my vision away. Mm -hmm. But the biggest one when you're trying to be functioning is that I couldn't really speak or put words yeah. together yeah. at all anymore. So those were my biggest symptoms and they're hard to deal with if you're only looking at them from a single perspective. Yeah. Like if you go to the hospital and you're only looking at one piece of the puzzle instead of looking at it as a whole, mm. it's harder to address it all successfully. Yeah. So I was really lucky to find the chiropractic neurologist that looked at it more from that global perspective and gave me things that I could do to just start decreasing those symptoms. And would you one. say that gave you the passion to want to pursue this then? Yeah, for yeah. sure. So I knew I wanted to be a chiropractor before that experience, but that drastically changed kind of the direction of my chiropractic yeah, yeah. career. So he was the one that encouraged me to go down to school in Georgia, being from Canada, mm. that was a far way yeah, to go, yeah. but specifically so that I could get a little bit more involved in the neurological yeah. side of it. And having an experience like that yourself gives you a little bit more empathy and compassion and passion for helping people that might be in a similar situation yeah, that for you've sure. been in. Yeah, no, definitely. That's amazing. Um, so many of the treatment modalities that I've come across in the past on my own recovery journey, looking for things, looking for people to potentially help me or tell me what's wrong with my body. I've noticed a lot of those things are focusing on either removing something from the body. So it might be some sort of elimination diets where you're sort of taking something away in order to try to improve your symptoms or it could be sort of you know a surgery where they're going in or medication so say weaken the immune system because originally my problem was seen as an immune problem so there's I've noticed a lot of treatment modalities are focused on weakening the body whereas functional neurology at least from my own understanding 
is concerned with the opposite. I was just wondering how how is it concerned with strengthening? You know, like how how would you describe it as being something that strengthens as opposed to weakens the body? Yeah, I think that we just look at it from a different perspective, right? If we think about every system in the body, there's a way that it is designed to function. And when we have different stressors, it can affect how optimally that system is functioning. And then we need to look at the system and say, when someone has something that's going on or not functioning properly, is it actually a structural problem with that system or is the system just not functioning the way it's supposed to and how do we address that dysfunction and try to make it function properly instead of just mm. making it function different or in a way we think might be better, yeah. right? Because yeah. if the system, if that pathway is still there and it's still able to work, let's make it work mm. the way mm. it was designed to, yeah. right? And I think a lot of that kind of philosophy of the body was designed perfectly and it has everything mm. that it needs mm. to function properly kind of comes from that traditional chiropractic philosophy, yeah. but it's a great way to look at it yeah. is your if your body can do that and it has all the parts, let's just put them together and allow it to do what it's designed to do. I think that's one of the most difficult messages for a lot of people sort of try to have to try to get their head around because especially the people who have been suffering with, you know, these undiagnosed, unexplained symptoms for so many years, what they end up doing is they almost end up hating their body mm -hmm. and they want to sort of, you know, why I mean, what is wrong with my body? And then they go and search for these thousands of different potential little problems they could try and change when really all the pieces might already be there. They just need to be positioned in a certain way. And that's really where you guys have sort of stepped in and helped in the clinic, isn't it, really? To look at the systems that were designed to do so many things in the body mm -hmm. and actually just sort of precisely get them in the right direction, train them, work them, and then almost exercise them by when I leave the clinic and want to try to experiment with different things. So yeah, it's really, yeah. really fascinating to me. So something else I noticed as well was that everyone in the team here was very friendly, <laughs> very compassionate, very attentive. Um, you never rushed me. I actually never rushed anyone else that was here at the time as well. Um, you know, you were very um, validifying to our, um, our kind of symptoms and our problems. You never disregarded the issues that we had. How important is that environment for you here? And why do you think that's so important to have that sort of outlook when it comes to clinicians dealing with patients, especially with these kind of issues? Yeah, I think that we just recognize that when we have patients coming here that they've been a million other places already and some of those experiences may not have been great, mm -hmm. right? And so we just want to make it an experience where you can come in and you can feel like you are being heard and how many people get told that things are in their head or things like that, that that might not be the case for yeah. you and that yeah. we're going to do the best we can to look at the system as a whole and figure out what's working great, what's working not as great, and how do we use what's working great to improve what's mm, not yeah. working as great, right? So not everything's a negative, not everything's on the downside mm. of something. A lot of people have systems in their body that are working really, really wonderfully, and we're going to do the best we can to use that system to help improve the system yeah. that isn't. And most of us here have been through an experience where we didn't feel the best we possibly could. And we just try to keep that compassion alive for everyone mm -hmm. who's coming in here and recognize that if you're not feeling great, things can be harder, things can be more challenging. So yeah. let's make it fun. Let's make it yeah. as exciting as we can. I would say can. fun. Yeah, fun is something that I felt during this as well because you know it doesn't have to be you know, being told the worst case scenario all the time. And actually one of the biggest sort of turning points for me in this whole experience was doing the research beforehand and suddenly coming here after the first day and when you sort of tilted me up and, you know, we found out the blood was dropping out of my head. That was how I felt standing up for the last seven years. But actually I had just been told that it was anxiety and that, you know, because of the traumatic experiences I've been through, 
that was the reason I was getting these symptoms. So just to have understood that on the very first day and that you guys have seen cases like that before, probably on multiple occasions, it's just sort of a huge breath of fresh air for me that can really allow me to you know, go into the, the, the days and the weeks just knowing that whatever you've got in store for me then is going to help to train that system. And then hopefully sort of by proxy almost the symptoms should drop off because yeah, we're improving those systems. So just to have the concerns answered by actual clinical testing yeah. for me was, yeah. But then along the way, just the actual, the care of, you know, if I needed to go to the toilet more, if I was tiring during one of the exercises, you know, it never felt like there was a time when, you know, in lots of, we spoke before about, you know, doctor's office, you've got a very limited time with somebody mm -hmm. and actually you end up feeling a bit more like a number rather than an actual human being. And here I've just kind of felt immense, like I say, compassion and care for the team. And yeah, I just think it's just been run just fantastically. It's a credit to, <laughs> credit to all of you because yeah, it's been oh, just you. an amazing experience here. So what I wanted to ask you, the final question I wanted to ask you. Okay. A lot of my audience are people with often undiagnosed, unrecognized daily debilitating symptoms, um, but a lot of them also have a passion to get better and to want to recover. But the problem is they're probably not, like I was for seven years. I yeah. went from clinician to clinician practitioner. I started reading sort of, you know, your conventional books. Then I read very complex literature eventually it led me here and i feel like this is the start for me of hopefully you know a new life again that you know of all those years i've missed out on i can go and rebuild on that and it's because i eventually found this place so what would your message be to those people who have these daily debilitating symptoms they feel lost but they have that burning desire and that passion to want to get better and to want to recover I think it's just to not give up hope that your body has the capacity and the ability to do it is the first yeah, thing, yeah. right? If you can just hold on to that hope and that knowledge that your body does have the capacity to heal mm -hmm. and improve and function better than it may be functioning right now, that's a big deal. And it's hard to hold on to that yeah. sometimes. Yeah, I understand yeah. that too from my own health journey, but it's important to have that. And then try to connect yourselves with people who have done it, right? Yeah. We talked a lot about when you were in the clinic about stacking up evidence that was for you mm. instead, of, instead of evidence that was against you, right? It's how can we create evidence that you are improving? How can we create evidence that you are gonna see this improvements maintained? How can you create evidence that you're gonna see improvements six months from now mm, going mm. through right and putting the correct people in your life is evidence of that yeah. as well right yeah. start reaching out to people that have made those changes in their own life how did they do it what resources might they have how can they be a support to you so that you have more and more evidence stacked up that's yeah. going to work with you instead yeah. of work against you and then reach out to people like I think you just sent mm. Dr. Kaiser a message yeah, on yeah. Instagram at first, right? Reach out to people like that and you never know what type of connection you might make that could be the difference for you. Definitely. And I think part of the reason I ended up actually coming here in the end was because I did form that connection with Dr. Kaiser and he was very responsive to a lot of my questions because he could tell I was clearly paying quite a big interest in the topic of functional neurology. Mm. I understood quite a lot of what he was saying in the videos and he always responded to me and I thought because he was like that behind the screen answering the messages and you know we had sort of a one-on-one -on -one call at one point as well I felt comfortable coming here knowing that that care that level of care would transition over even with me flying halfway across the world so just on that point what would you say to people who arrive at the clinic what would be the best sort of mindset approach they could have if they want to end up having the most successful recovery from this process i think just being willing to work and put the effort in because it's not going to be easy mm, most it's not, likely it's not easy. <laughs> right it's not easy but if you're dedicated to it and you're ready to work and you're ready to trust a little bit then that's just the best thing that yeah. you can do come ready to work and we're not going to lead you down a path or we're not going to tell you things 
that aren't true. We're pretty upfront right from the beginning. Mm. This is what we think is going to help and this is what we're going to do and this is what we're going to monitor to make sure yeah. that we're seeing the improvements that we want to be seeing, but come with an open mind and then just ready to yeah. put in a little work. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> I remember Dr. Kaiser saying to me, you know, it's, it's not going to be easy, it's going to be hard work. But I said to myself, I did put a lot of eggs in, in my, you know, a lot of eggs in one basket, thinking that this was going to help me to improve. But then I didn't really want to put that much pressure on myself. So all I ended up saying to myself was, as long as I make the effort to come here, to make that journey, to put myself in front of you guys and then be willing to participate in whatever you've got in store for me, then I can be proud of myself. And if you guys can't help me out, then it was just a problem in my body that wasn't meant to be resolved, you know, during this sort of, this health sort of modality, this pathway. Um, but yeah, I've just been so blown away by the, like I said, the level of care, the, the kind of compassion, the enthusiasm to make this all a fun experience, because I have found it a lot of fun. And, you know, that idea of finding the problem very quickly, you know, completely being there on my level with, you know, you guys, the team here, who you understand the struggles we go through because you've been through your own. And yeah, I'm just so, so grateful because you guys have just genuinely changed my life and I really hope that there's something I can do from this point moving on into the future that can help change other people's lives even if that's just directing them in a pathway that's more like this and hopefully they can get some of those undiagnosed and unrecognized symptoms resolved and you know get some time back because time is very precious and there's a lot of time just spent on you know, trying to find out where it's best for people. So no, I'm really, really, very grateful. And it's been an amazing experience. I just want to say thank you so much. It's yeah. just genuinely changed my life. And of course. Yeah, just absolutely an honor to be here and a privilege. So thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> thank you. Right, so I'm joined by Dr. Nathan Kaiser from his clinic here in Chelsea, Michigan. Firstly, I just want to say a massive thank you for spending the time to have a chat with me about my treatment here and just how we've gone over the last three weeks or so and just wow sort of what a three weeks has been after sure. seven years of just ongoing pain and symptoms and just looking for answers not getting answers at all um, so originally I came to your clinic um, with a lot of digestive symptoms a lot of kind of slow bowel motility, what it felt like to me. Uh, temperature dysregulation, I couldn't quite deal with hot and cold environments. Um, breathing difficulties, I experienced a lot of shortness of breath. Um, orthostatic intolerance, so I struggled to stand upright um, with regards to sort of my heart racing and then feeling like I was gonna faint. And it just felt like a lot of the blood around my body, it sort of fell to my feet, my feet turned very purple. And there's just a lot of symptoms sort of behind that as well, ones that don't really rise to the surface as much. But when I actually start to think about it, there's tons of symptoms. It almost felt like my body was in a very kind of hyper aroused state, you know, regarding whichever environment I found myself in. So I guess I just want to ask you from the first day I arrived, what you thought about my physical and emotional state? Hmm. Well, we've had a chance to talk, kind of become YouTube and internet pen pals mm. a little bit. Um, <clears throat> but it's it's not dissimilar from a lot of folks that we see where you're kind of mixing together a few different things. We've got the fact that you haven't been able to like do normal for, for a number of years, which creates its own set of circumstances, right? Because you're just not in the world and in your body the same way you normally would be. So there, there's an element of that that's just getting conditioning again. But then the parts that are more, more concerning were just relative to the fact that, um, so the way, the way I think about things is a lot of times just through the nature of inputs and outputs. So as we take in sensory information, are we able to interpret that and then convert that into the normal output that would occur? And one of the things that we picked up on with you pretty early on diagnostically was the fact that you didn't necessarily understand where you were in space very well to start with. 
And then if you tackle that question a little bit further and you think about, well, if I don't understand where I am, if I don't understand where my head is, I don't interpret gravity perfectly well, then it's hard to then do all the things that you would normally do in a machine in gravity, right? So it's like, um, you know, simple things would be, do you guys have, do you guys have weed whackers, uh, like weed trimmers in the UK? Mm. No, I don't mm. know. We probably got a different name for them, but that's probably true. Yeah. But if you think about it, it's like, you know, a little trimmer that you trim the grass with, but if you have a yeah, gas edge, one. Edge trimmer. Yeah. 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 But if you have a if you have a gas one, right, and you tip it over upside down and then you can't feed the gas through the tube, then the machine doesn't run very well. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The same thing goes the other way. And we're we're built to be able to tolerate a lot of different interpretations of gravity. That's why gymnasts flip and we can go in outer space and fly in airplanes mm-hmm. and do all those things. But they're all contingent on being able to interpret where your head is relative to the ground yeah. and where the rest of your body is, especially your heart, relative to your head. That was one of the things that we kind of figured out pretty quickly doing some tilt table tests. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you can probably share a little bit about your experience on that. Yeah, well, I mean, I've been doing that a lot throughout the, throughout the week with the, the other videos I've put together. But um, yeah, I just remember sort of when I came in here on the first day having well, pretty much going over to your your sort of table over there and being assessed and straight away I was lying on my side, I was out of breath. Um, and after we did that original neurological assessment and you said, you know, I want you back in the afternoon for further assessment with the tilt table, with the uh, video ocular um, headset, I, um, I was a bit bewildered on thinking how, you know, I thought this was all gonna be spaced out across the first week. But to have that all done by the first day was yeah pretty extraordinary to know that I even pushed my body to that extent. Um, but yeah, the first day was incredibly hard, and yeah, it felt a lot of fatigue. So um, yeah, so from the kind of a, from a clinical perspective, following the assessments, which systems in my body did you identify as the key priorities to address based on your findings from those tests? Yes, yeah, so we, we looked a lot at. Basically, these integrated sensory systems, they're, they're multimodal systems, and they, they integrate information that comes from your inner ear, from your vestibular system, the way you move your head, but also just what you sense when your head is still, um, in the way that integrates with activities of the ocular motor system, right? So your ears and your eyes are like your elbow and your wrist, they, they work together. So when I move my head, I interpret that I move my head my neck's involved with that, but then I also have movement of my eyes so I can see where I'm going. Um, and all of that gives you a stationary place in the world so you understand where things are. That all has to incorporate with an autonomic system. So a lot of your, your symptoms are largely autonomic, but they're autonomic in a way that, um, that correlates with postural system, right? So uh, for example, like when we looked at your eyes and the position of your eyes, and then we augment that, we can make you feel nauseous mm-hmm. by just changing uh, or by, by taxing the activity that was happening with your eyes. We can do the same thing with having you move on the table or you know, tilting you. Basically anything that would stress the system of understanding where you were in space through the visual, vestibular, and proprioceptive systems, we could bring out those autonomic symptoms. So we, yeah. it helps us understand that all of these things integrate in a point. So anything that, where we have to, to process inputs or create outputs is going to use oxygen. It's going to use fuel to be able to run the neurons to do that. Yeah. So it's also going to create a need for motor activity, muscle activity, which means we're going to have to send blood to that area as well. So anything that needs blood or anything that needs oxygen, you have to somehow be able to deliver it there with a blood vessel, which means it then therefore has to be controlled by the autonomous system so it really helps us to be able to pare down and understand where these errors are in the vestibular system where that happens with the ocular system and then how those integrate through cerebellar and brainstem pathways really helps us understand how that then has an effect on the autonomic output yeah yeah so that was a lot with because i noticed a lot of the activities you had me doing um yes there was the gradual tilts on the tilt table to expose me to the um you know, to help with the borrow reflex sensitivity to help to expose me more to being upright. Mm-hmm. But I started to notice as well that a lot more of the 
exercises that you had me doing were things involving the eyes as well, sort of, you know, with the rotational chair, keeping my eyes fixated on the target, and then also, um, you know, with the bead string as well. And even when you were sort of tilting my head, getting, getting me to sort of look up at your nose, those quick um, head tilts as well. So that's all kind of having an input to the visual and the vestibular system and also with the cerebellum as well. Right. Yeah, they, they gets them to operate together. Yep. So a small input can equal the correct output so they're not mis mismatched. Um, you know, I think those, those combinations of movements help to be able to understand what those are. And you can see that output and being able to kind of do more, tolerate more, mm -hmm. build, build that side. I was going to ask as well, the... Before I came here, I was dealing with a lot of sort of strange, you know, undiagnosed symptoms. Nobody could pinpoint why they came about, where they came from. But a lot of the time I was being pinned on, you know, me having anxiety, me just being anxious in pretty much every situation. Whilst there is obviously an anxious component to this, because like you said previously, if you don't know where you are in space, then you're not going to feel comfortable in any environment where there's more, perhaps more going on. Um, could you sort of explain why from your findings of some of the tests you ran, why it isn't just a case of anxiety that I could consciously control? Sure. Yeah, I think that's the tough part about anxiety is we, we assume it is something that is um, kind of our own misinterpretation of the world and we make ourselves anxious or, mm -hmm. or something makes us anxious. But anxiety, I think you could, you could get to a place of understanding it well if you think about what it is in terms of just what it does in your physiology, it just creates a higher level of arousal or a higher level of attention, which is to say it's signaling that we should be paying attention to something. So if there's something that's going on with the way we feel, those signals, those senses, those feelings give us a sense of we should put our attention into that. So if it's something that you experience at a high level for a long period of time, you end up in this position where we have a physiology that generates a behavior, right? Which is a be an anxious response or just a, a more attentive response. So that's a, the physiological component. But then over time, that sensation that turns into a behavior turns into a habit, right? So our body starts to kind of get really good at it, yeah. and become yeah. kind of adapted to it. And then that's mixed in with things that are real potential like behavioral anxieties where last time I did this, it was awful and I felt terrible. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna probably do things in my brain to help me avoid that, right? So it, it builds in these different layers of things that would cause what we, what we term anxiety, yeah. um, but they're physiological, they can be habits, they're, they're things that we learn and we probably should learn how to do. Yeah. So we have to kind of unwind them all, we have to unwind the physiology that just puts you in the overwhelm to start with. And we have to be able to reconcile some of the habits and just be like, my body does this without me. We need to do things that allow us to, to stop that from happening to start with. We break the pattern. And then, then it's easier to actually do the real behavior things where it's like, I haven't been going out to eat because it freaks me out. Yeah. And yeah. I felt terrible the last few times I did it. Mm. Now I'm feeling better. Maybe I can start to move toward that and get comfortable with it again. So yeah. I think there are different layers to it. That yeah. Is. yeah. So there's there's the physiological component to it, but then there's sort of the unwinding of the trying to recondition yourself. Once you've sort of brought that under control, then it's almost like gradual exposure therapy to try to familiarize yourself yeah. with those environments again and feel comfortable with them again. I think so. so I think one of the things that I've noticed in that over the years of doing this is <clears throat> Most people, as you start to feel better, your mind kind of opens up to the opportunities of like, I'm willing to try that, right? So there's like, there's an underlying physiology that almost leads you to doing more things. This has been my observation, how about? We've seen that with my case quite a lot over these, these few weeks. Yeah, yeah. just kind of open to it a little bit more and that just kind of comes naturally as you start to feel better. Yeah, yeah. So I guess it's building on a little bit from that point, but you told me earlier in the week that your aim with a lot of your treatment you do at the clinic here is to first stabilize the body and then introduce dynamic retraining of the body. What do you mean by that? That's a good question. Um, 
yeah, so we kind of moved from stabilizing things means like let's get it to just run when I put X input in, I get the correct output to come out. And if I can do that just at the very simplest levels of, you know, can I stand up? Can I be still when I'm trying to be still? Can I move when I'm trying to move? Can I move accurately to where I'm trying to move? Can I do it without having big delays or moving erroneously? Like simple stuff to start with. Can I move when I'm trying to move? Can I be still when I'm trying to be still? Can I do the thing I'm trying to do? Those things have to happen first before we can add any layer of complexity. And that complexity is where we make things dynamic. And then we say, okay, if, if we can do all these individual parts, can we then turn that into adding two things together? And then can we add three things together? And then can we make it more complex? Can we add cognition to it? So, you know, for a lot of people, can you know, the reason that we talked about over our time together is like, can I just get my body to correctly understand where I'm at so that I can get blood to my head? That is a really great place to start from because if I can't do that, running's not gonna solve anything. Doing, you know, doing floor exercises yeah. isn't gonna solve anything because I don't have the machinery established to translate into those more complex activities. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I completely agree when I sort of observe how there are a lot of sufferers out there that have a lot of these complex issues, but they're, because they don't know what to do to try to get better, what they are doing is trying their best to live like a normal human, but what we don't realise is actually normal human behaviours are complex, and there's lots behind just walking down the road, going to a cafe, having a chat with someone, standing up while talking, there's a lot to it, and I guess you get a lot of people in here that are the, are the very sort of, they need that stability first, I think that's yeah, that's really, really important to know. Um, so I noticed that when I brought up the, the matter of, I know you got me to write it originally in the forms that I filled out, but I noticed that you weren't as concerned by the potential cause behind why I, when about I started having symptoms and issues, because I sort of brought it up quite a lot what I thought the link was between these IV antibiotics I was given to my, given seven years ago, and that was the onset of the symptoms. And instead, what I recognised that you paid more attention to was the what was in front of you, and yeah. that's what you wanted to work with. So why is it you worked like that? Why is it you were more interested in what I presented to you after the findings from the examinations? First of all. I'm fascinated by the forensics of trying to solve the problem of what did happen. Mm. But at the end of the day, I can't know for sure because I didn't know you before. Yeah. So I only know you as you are now. Um, so a lot of that would be conjecture. And then for me, it comes down to like, well, what, what do I need to know to be able to help you move forward? Because that's the most important part is moving forward and getting on. So I look at it almost like a, like a hurricane, you know, like if we were in, in the job of hurricane cleanup, we're going to rebuild the, the city after the hurricane comes through. Um, I would want to make sure that the hurricane is first gone mm -hmm. before I go in. Yeah. Right. So, it, you know, if it's something that is an infection, if it is something that is viral or something that, that is happening internally, um, we want to make sure that that's run its course has been resolved, we've treated it effectively. It's no longer like the primary generator. Same thing when we think about injuries. You know, those are easier because the hit has happened. Mm -hmm. We're not currently being you know, injured again, not currently in a car accident. Yep. So those are easier, but so we wanna make sure we dig enough to find out, okay, this isn't something that is still currently an infectious state that we're going to, we're going to patch something up and then it's gonna to get torn down again. And once we understand that, then my job is to figure out like, how do we fix the buildings? How do we repair the city again and get it to function? For me, a lot of that comes down to thinking about um, learning. So the one thing that we have as humans that, that is kind of our superpower is that we have the capacity to learn. We have neurons that can undergo neuroplasticity. They can generate new synapses. We can generate, in some cases, you know, thousands and millions of new connections. So the goal is can we teach this body to do things again that are functional so that we can carry those forward so we can take, we 
we can take function and turn it into things that matter in our life. And that's that's the that's the part I focus on because that's where I have the biggest impact with my time. Yeah. Is to be able to say, okay, what's done is done. Let's figure out how we can go forward. What can we do to solve this? I also think as a patient as well, you you can, if you look back, like me, if you've been diagnosed with, with whatever for a number of years, but you've experienced symptoms for you know years or decades or whatever, you can quite easily establish between when you have acute issues right. that need, like you said, the fire, you know, the fire needs putting out. But then I think you start to recognise these patterns of things that are, are creeping up daily, weekly, yearly, it's the same old thing and nobody can explain what they are. I think that's more what you're getting at when you get people come to your clinic like that because we spoke originally and you said about how I would need to make a commitment to come here, to travel here just for that assessment because you can't work with what, what you can't, what you haven't seen, what you haven't assessed. Um, yeah, so no, that's a no, brilliant answer. Thank you yeah. for clearing that up. And we talked about that last part a little bit in round you know, being able to come here, because I understand, I understand that people come purely on faith, because I don't know, mm-hmm. I don't know what to do. I, I don't, I don't really do telehealth. Um, I don't, you know, I do my best to try to help people navigate into a direction, but as far as like, what I physically do with people really requires that I see them, because I have to see what's going on and how can we affect the system in real time, which is really hard to do I mean, maybe someday technology will yeah, there, yeah. but as it stands right now, um, yeah, that's where I'm most useful. So some of my recurring symptoms from the past seven years arose at times during the weeks I spent at the clinic. Um, however, I felt they were happening less regularly and that I was more ambitious when they did come up and I felt like I could try to do a bit more with them. Um, I was wondering how important is it to face these symptoms that have been recurring over however long in my case seven years how important is it like to face these symptoms and what do they mean when you know whilst you're recovering Mm -hmm. that's that's a tough one on your head because the symptoms are the thing that have been the the enemy the villain so to speak for those seven years right and then you find yourself in a position where i'm asking you to chase them Right to say we're going to ch- we're going to try to get to that spot where we're not feeling very good, and the reason for that is because as we're going, we're trying to we're basically taking a body that can do that can lay down and get up sometimes to eat and like sometimes be able to talk for a little while mm. and sometimes not, mm. and we're trying to take that body and turn it into a body that walks around town and goes out to dinner and mm. chats mm. with friends mm. and like does exercise and like lives life so to build from one to the other there's there's a capacitance issue so like what do i have the capacity do i have to create capacity we don't have the ability to create capacity without pushing it to the challenge past what it's capable of now so that our body responds by building more capacity so the only way to get there is to go past the current threshold and unfortunately that current threshold is associated with symptomatology, yeah, yeah. right. So, but you have you can't go short of it and change the capacity. You have to go past it to change it. So we're pushing to go past it in a safe way, in a way that we can control, and then be able to use what we've all got given within us to be able to sleep and heal, and then be able to push that capacity a little bit further. So it really is, it does mess with your mind because you're like, I've spent all my time trying not to feel this way, mm. and then now. I've tasted what it feels like to feel better and now I'm like chasing not feeling good and it's the same feeling so it's like it does mess with your head but it's also if you want to get to a place you have to step by step be able to build a capacity that that the person that you want to be would have and I think in my case as well um, it links back to what we were saying just a moment ago about how I felt from my point of view I needed that stability I needed that um, those results on the tilt table to come back to tell me that actually this isn't all just in my head um, about the symptoms I'm getting when I'm standing up and the shortness of breath and the increased heart rate. And I think once you then take that out of the equation and I can build on that by experimenting in new environments, then I'm more comfortable knowing about the symptoms that I'm going to get are 
just part of the recovery process. But like I say, I think yeah, you need almost to have those under control first to then give you the freedom to want to explore. But yeah, it's definitely been tough to, because you wonder, because obviously I have a limited time, I've had a limited time here with you. You worry about going back home thinking, oh, these symptoms are gonna come up again. But once you then can say to yourself, actually, you know, this is, this is what I need to go through. I need to experience these, but in different environments, and then I'll become familiar with the environment. And then something that's in between, you know, your home and doing something crazy, then that becomes your sort of new norm and that's how you live life. So we talk about this building evidence. Yeah. Like that's the language we use here is we want to build a pile of evidence that shows you can do this. Yeah. And if you got that pile of evidence that shows you can do this, eventually it will outweigh the pile of I can't do this. Yeah. Right. And that makes it a lot easier place to operate from. And within three weeks, I feel like I've done more than in seven years. <laughs> It's crazy, right? right? Yeah, it's mad. And because you can, because you felt that, and you lived it, you have evidence. Yeah, it's easier to then carry that home. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting one. We had a day in the final week where the plan for me that you put in place changed changed during the day mm -hmm. because whether you did it intentionally or not, you trigger some of my symptoms through certain eye movements through the uh, VOR headset. Um, and that caused me a lot of digestive discomfort, a lot of constriction. I was just in a lot of pain. And then we had to sort of change what we were doing for the remainder of the day. What do you think are sort of, of course, the benefits, you know, is to be flexible and everything, but it's a very unique um, thing I've seen from a healthcare professional to alter the pathway they take with a patient throughout the single day that they arrive at the clinic. Because everywhere else I've been, it's, very, it's been very sort of set in stone. Mm. You know, you come in, this is what you're going to get, and then you're going to leave at the end of the day, but you kind of change that. So why is Yeah, you don't that? see most of the ones that change. So it's a constant assessment. So when I get you in in the morning, we have, we have a tree of things that we have available as a plan, right? So we have a loose plan of like, these are what we'd love to get done. If this doesn't happen, we'll switch this way. And, we'll, and so we have, our plan has a lot of contingencies because we want to change it fast. Um, the goal is to iterate quickly. So if we see something that is working, we'll push our chips in on that and we'll drive it until you start to fatigue. Um, if something, if I notice that something's not working well, the goal is to quickly notice it and be able to shift it so that we can, so that we don't overload that metabolic capacity in those neurons. That's what it all comes down to is the idea of metabolic capacity, which is how much can a neuron do or how much can a pool of neurons do within the system. So we want to take them, again, that's the capacity thing. We want to take them just past their capacity. Once they're there, we don't need to keep pushing them. We want to give them a chance to heal and rest. So when you notice as we kind of move through the day, I'm targeting different neuron sets. We run through that whole pathway, and then we let you take a break, recuperate, run through that whole pathway, take a break. If we get to a point in the pathway where we're already toasted, and we'll skip it and move to another part, or we'll try to access it from a different way. And so build, building on that point, I've noticed as well that not a lot of clinicians do this where you've packed, you've packed so much into three weeks. Like your uh, kind of treatment modality is to have an intensive, you know, come see me three times a day, five days a week for three weeks. Why is that important to you? Uh, it's important, well, it's important for a couple of reasons. Number one, when people travel, we, we have a limited amount of time. But also, a lot of the people that we're working with have problems with neurological function. Um, and when we compare that to something like soft tissue, like if I've, I've you know, injured a joint, injured a muscle, sprained a ligament, etc., there's a half-life to how long it takes a cell to develop and to recover or to heal. The neurons are designed to do it lightning fast, milliseconds fast. Right? So we grow and we learn, and you, you, I don't know if you've seen videos, but you can actually see synapses being generated mm -hmm. and, and dendrites sprouting and all these things that happen when we learn, and they happen very quickly. As compared to if you're going to like rehab a knee, soft tissue, the half-life for that is you know on the order of seven to ten days like so there's just longer durations of healing time for that to happen so we try to take advantage of that and say 
if we only need a short period of time to be able to recover enough to then stimulate that tissue again, we should take advantage of that yeah. and try to push it up to the capacity and then keep going like that. So being able to consolidate it allows us to be able to take advantage of that neuroplasticity. It also allows us to be able to focus, meaning you're not trying to do this and then also go work and also take care of the family. You're focused and that focus is useful because it allows us to be able to use it. It also lets us be able to kind of, in a sense, control the day more where we know what you're resting, we know what you're doing, we know what you're eating, we know everything about what you're doing so that we can take that data in and it helps us iterate faster so we get more. Overall, the goal is to try to be able to use that to generate as much momentum as we can by creating evidence, by you know, testing data, seeing things change, and putting together that momentum that allows us to push it forward into regular life. Without doing that, it's very, the, the transition between in the lab and in the field is much harder if we don't already have that momentum of, of that evidence going yeah. forward. Yeah, I must admit as well, with the sort of practitioners that I'd seen previously, it's, they give you something to do or they'll give you a treatment and the next time you see it, it could be a month, it could be three months, it could be half a year. Um, and you don't feel like you're sort of being properly observed in that time. So when I booked this trip originally, I saw it as a, almost like a treatment trip, like I was gonna go all in on this. And I ended up sort of booking a final week because the last week in my head originally was thinking to myself, if it does go well, I can still be here, but I can try and treat it a bit more like a holiday in the respect of if this does give me the capacity to be able to, you know, do things that I might normally do if I go away somewhere, then I might sort of test the waters with that a little bit and push, you know, push the boat out a bit and see if I can go to these cafes or, you know, football game or, you know, the wildlife conservatory, all these different places and just see how I get on. But yeah, so what you were saying earlier about sort of, you know, neurons forming and all of that happening quite rapidly, I guess it sort of contributes to this next question, which is sort of, how, how, how was it that you were able to change such an array of symptoms in such a short period of time? Because these obviously had been with me for so many years. Yeah. Um, and, and all at once, it seems, with the systems that you were kind of training, um, you know, I can think of you know, my digestion improving, the heart rate slowing, the shortness of breath going, um, you know, temperature dysregulation, being able to handle that more, being sort of less you know, aroused in these sort of busy situations, feeling calmer, um, sitting up more in a day, as opposed to lying on the floor, which I previously spent 90, 95% of each day in you know, the first week of your clinic. It's just all of those things seem to sort of go in tandem and have improved at the same simple, similar rate, but they're all going in the right direction at once. Is that to do with the brain? Is that to do with the yeah. pathways that we're training? Yeah, I would say I'm not doing any of it. We're just kind of giving you a little bit of guidance. I mean, that's all happening within you. And I think that part's really important is a lot of times people come in, and if you've been sick for a long time, it's very easy to develop a poor relationship with your own body, where it's like, my body is revolting against me we are not on the same team, right? And you start to feel like my body is weak or my body is broken or it doesn't do the things I expect it to do. That's not true at all. Your body is gonna do the best it can in any given circumstance. If we can change the circumstance, we can give your body a chance to kind of correct back toward where it's trying to go. So you saw an amazing amelioration of the symptoms and it's, it's beautiful. But what it really is, is it's, it's letting your body get strong enough to do the things it's already trying to do without having to do these adaptations that are, are less than. Um, your body will always go for optimum capacity and efficiency. So if you give it a way to do something that is better, it's gonna take it as long as it can run. Will it fatigue? Up to a point, that's what we talked about with capacity. But then if you push it further, it can do more can do more and can do more so I think you know almost getting to the point where you start to believe that your body is like you guys are on the same squad yeah, yeah. that part really matters and in recognizing that like we all like we're built with that ability to heal 
but we've got to steer it sometimes. And a lot of times the thing we don't recognize is that we're going past our abilities. Yep. We're just we're too complex for what we're capable of in that moment. But if we back down to the simplest version and build it out symptom, system by system, we can build complexity, but we can't start there all the time. It's interesting you say that because the word sort of complex came to my mind when I was thinking about a lot of people who I've spoken to across the last, I would say, five or six years when I've been doing bits and pieces online. It's been other people who have been suffering from kind of chronic health symptoms. And I've been there myself where instead of actually trying to correct parts in the body and then trust it to do what it's best at doing, which is what it previously did with me for like 18 years where I was fit and healthy, people try to fixate and focus on so many different things that are ultimately out of their control, but because they've read somewhere that they can influence it, their mind is in a million places. And then I, I personally think that really stalls recovery. And for years, that cost me a lot of money, it's cost me a lot of time, had the same symptoms, but you're, you're telling yourself you can change these things, but. Yeah, it's almost like you're trying to wrestle your own body into submission and, mm. and uh, but I think when you can like back down and work with it, yeah, there's a, it's a, there's a different thing there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So what changes did you personally note in me from when I arrived on day one to myself now or when I left on, on week three? Just, you know, any changes sort of? Well, maybe it's better to start from like my perspective of when you walked in because I know you can share what you feel. Yeah. But as an outsider, um, I mean, we did your report of findings. So going through... 15 minutes of looking at videos of your eyes, looking at the scores you had on a tilt test, talking about the things we saw on the exam. You were laying down, laying down on your side. When you left, you'd lay down. A lot of shortness of breath. That pretty much, I would say, encapsulated a lot of your attention was spent on dealing with that. So there wasn't a lot of room for other, other anything really, yeah. other inquiry, other thoughts, other presence being, just being able to be up and around. I would also like... Would you say lack of personality almost? Just, yeah, it becomes to a distraction to the point where you're not really in, the, you're not there. Yeah. You're with your symptoms. You're not really in, in the room. And I think also looking at even just, you know, your brother came with you every single time. And in the beginning, it was very much in, uh, you know, like he was at your side of like pretty much ready for you to fail. Yeah. Because yeah. that's been the existence. And moving toward like rather than that, it's hanging out over here doing some work or hanging with staff or going to the comic shop or to the antique store. So like that even in him, you could see that he wasn't as worried about you. You okay. I mean? Yeah. And at the same time, you know that, that he wasn't as worried about you. I think he wasn't as worried about you because you weren't as worried about you. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then you, know, you can walk around and you're laughing and you're joking with people and, and able to kind of like, mm. like just be. Yeah. I think that's the thing without being overly descriptive is just like being able to be without being completely preoccupied with dealing with how you feel. Mm. Um, to see that in people is just magic because you realize like they're, um, they get their time back. So that's the thing about being sick is, is like every day is, is time you're, you're ticking off that you're not getting to be you. And I think that's, um, like that's the biggest loss of, of being sick is that your time's ticking. Yeah. Um, so to see people get time back is really important. And like you were saying, when I've been able to be present with, with everybody in the clinic here and sort of like other patients coming in and you know, the team here and even my brother and my brother's girlfriend, it's when you're in those moments and you're actually enjoying conversation with people, you're present, but you're also not being analytical. You're, it's, it's until the end of the day when you might sit down with a dinner and you're there, you're sat there eating, you're thinking, what did I just do that day? Whereas previously, it's always planning forward in advance, you know, what's this next thing coming up? You know, 
it's like a thousand different concerns and every day, every little variable, every, every little variable you're trying to control. And it's your anal you're analyzing the past to you, the future you. You're never being able to be in that moment because the moment is just pain and suffering. And yeah, I've, I've really noticed that myself through these, these weeks and I do feel the old me is coming back, but I also do recognize that it is a long process and it's not just a three week fix. It's yeah. It's interesting that, yeah, because you've noticed that in three weeks. And then, you know, the hope is that as time continues to go, you go, oh, wow, how I was after those three weeks was nowhere near where I am now. Yeah. Or, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but it's not like you have to wait. It's not like you have to wait till the end to get the ice cream, right? You're eating it all the way along because mm -hmm. everything, mm -hmm. you're, like, you're waking up as you're going through. And, and I think that part's really. Uh, it's fun to observe, it's fun to be a part yeah, of it. It's just, it's just like a win on top of another win. And when there is a setback with symptoms, actually you observe that, you know, instead of just lying on the floor and giving in and staying inside and not doing anything that day where I felt rough, I was out and about. Yes, I had a bit of a sit down, you know, I, I caught, kind of caught my breath. I didn't feel comfortable at that time in that scenario. But actually I, I did go out, I did do that situation that I didn't, never thought I would do. And even that you could use a win. It is a win. Yeah, yeah. And it's a, it's pushing past the capacity a little bit so that tomorrow you can go a little more. And Do you think that's one of the hardest things for, for people to know that they are, they are facing their symptoms more to get to that, that next stage? It's yeah, almost it like they don't the know what's over the other end of the rainbow yeah. because they're not willing to sort of climb up it. That, that sort of analogy where mm -hmm. if they just broke through a little bit, they'd be able to see what's kind of hidden behind the door for them. I think you, I think you hit that well because it is, it's just getting a glimpse of it enough to where you're like, I want that, and it gives you that compelling thing to push through, and then it's almost like the dominoes are easier to push over because you know like if I push through this, there's something on the other side, and once you do that, you do that, you do that, you kind of create the habit of doing that, then it's like. Yeah, then you're looking for it. Then yeah, I'm just going to go, yeah. and I'll probably there will be a point where I don't feel good, and it's fine because tomorrow I'll wake up and I'll do it again, and then I'll, I'll recover and I'll do better tomorrow. And then just uh, there's a momentum to that that's hard to that's hard to compete. With. I think the way I would I would describe that in my own experience being here over the, over this last month is that I actually start to feel a little bit restless yeah. when I'm doing less now which is a really interesting feeling. You know, I'm sort of sat there back at, you know, where we're staying, the cottage. And if I'm not going out, if I'm not doing anything, I feel like I should be. And I feel like maybe the energy I've been generating through doing this and stabilizing the body, it's, it's making me more curious to explore, which is, yeah, just such an exciting feeling. And since I got on well, never had that feeling before, so. It's interesting, isn't it? Your body's like, Let's go. Yeah, it, it, that's it. it tells you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, so, if you don't mind me asking, you had some issues yourself over mm -hmm. about well, just under a decade ago, seven years ago, the same time that I got on well. <laughs> um, and you ended up requiring heart surgery. Did functional neurology play any part in your recovery at all from that? So, in the recovery process, yeah. So. Without going too deep into it, um, I ended up having a, like a structural heart problem, uh, and I was able to have ablation surgery, which was awesome that it was available. To put it in perspective, that surgery has only been available since 1997. So, you know, me, 50 years ago, I didn't would have had that same opportunity. Um, so I feel really lucky that I had a really great uh, team that helped me with that. We had to fight for it a little bit to get to get to that point, but. Um, in the in the recovery process, so I had I had gone from being a like very competitive CrossFit athlete. So I was working out a lot. I was doing this work. I had a young family. I was part of. Uh, I was on a brain injury rehab board. We were doing a research project. Um, I was teaching around the country and in Europe and in Canada, and um, so it was just like doing a lot. And I understood. <clears throat> that after I had to take, I took a whole year off of exercise in the lead up to finally getting heart surgery because I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it anymore. Um, so I knew 
by the time I got working out again, it had been about a year and a half. Um, so I had to build out strategies to be able to do the same things that I talk about with you, which is win the day, get the momentum of building capacity, building strength again. And a lot of that started out with just like, well, who do I, what do I want this body to be able to do when I wrote well done? So I want this body to be able to do these things. And then I worked backwards from there and said, how do I build that? And that's how I built my rehab back. So I actually started, um, uh, from an exercise perspective, I started back with rock climbing, which I hadn't really done before. But I knew because I hadn't done it before, and I knew it was so grip intensive, that my grip would fail before my heart did. So it would be a good way for me to be able to work back without being frustrated. I knew if I went back into just heavy weightlifting, I'd want to do that version again, mm. and it wouldn't, wouldn't match with what my, my skill level was, or my capacity level was. So I did things like that, and I worked at building bit by bit by bit to try to just get strength and, and kind of the same thing we're talking about here. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's amazing how kind of quickly when you do make those changes and they build on one another, mm -hmm. how they can, yeah, make the, <laughs> make every day of your life better and make you actually look forward to sort of waking up and facing the day rather than sort of having that. I think at times we've all had it where it feels a bit like a defeatist point of view where we, we rather sit back, we rather sure. observe. I felt like an observer for, mm -hmm. for most of sort of these last seven years. I feel like I've been observing other people's lives. I felt like a lot of time when I'm in a room with people, I'm not there. I feel just like I'm watching things happen. And um, yeah, I just feel like a shadow of the person I was. I'm sure you probably felt that at times during that period as well. And it's I just... felt that. I've watched a lot of people go through that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm very connected with with that idea, and it's it's uh, there's a sadness to it, but there's also there's a lot of hope in it too, because you look at the upside and you think about like if this is where somebody's at right now. It's like Michelangelo with a slab of marble. It's like mm. if we can if we can figure this out, there's so far for this person to go mm. in mm. you know in a relative short period of time. Like, yeah. To me, that's exciting. I yeah. look at that and go, "Let's we should do this. Let's get going." And, uh, and also, there's that thing as, as well where you, if you feel to feel one end of the scale, you really need to feel the other. Sure. And then suddenly you start appreciating these things more in life. You start noticing more. You start enjoying spending your time with more people. And it's just a really exciting part. I, well, I'm certainly feeling it. It feels like a honeymoon phase at the moment, a little bit. It is, yeah. But it does feel, you know, just like almost being able to do nothing in a day sometimes and just sitting back and observing and, and enjoy, let's say, enjoying conversation with people, but taking things at a slow pace, being able to calm down and just relax and all of those things. Yeah, it's just really enjoyable and all yeah. those things never were. So. Yeah, I'm really grateful for the you know, functional neurology and what it's able to sort of provide. I guess my next question sort of leads onto that point as well, which is that a lot of people I know, a lot of people who have sort of spoke, I've spoken to over the years, a lot of people are identifying with a condition that's related to a certain system in the body. So it might be the heart, the lungs, the digestive system, you know, kidneys, pancreas, all these different organs in the body. Um, but they're having lots of unexplained symptoms that are sort of multiple symptoms involving multiple organs in the body, but they're identifying with the condition. So why is it that, firstly, why is it that people do that? But secondly, how can they kind of change their mindset to think that learning about functional neurology could be something that benefits them in their life? Sure, I, I think, you know, We've built out a system that's relatively siloed in how we look at, at medicine and health. Um, but I think a lot of that is because it's a lot to chew. Yeah. So you can spend a lifetime learning about just cardiology or just neurology. Um, and I think that that's, I don't think that that's not useful. I think that's, that's very useful. Um, but also at the same time, all of these things are connected. So the way you breathe is dictated by a rhythm set in your brainstorm. But how you breathe also, that same rhythm also generates the rhythm of how your blood vessels contract and how your heart contracts. And it has to be in rhythm with whether the breath is in or out, it's gonna change the contractility of your heart. 
and that beats against your spine, which creates its own rhythm that goes upward and that interacts with the resting frequency of muscles. So you, you end up realizing that like, this whole machine was built to run as a one machine. You can't take parts out of it without really disrupting the machine. And we would expect that if I affect one area, especially in the control systems, anything that's going to be under control of those systems is going to have potential to fall out of optimal. Yeah. You know what I mean? So um, I think where neurology is useful, I don't have any massive skill set in understanding any of these things individually. There's people that know a lot more. But what we're paying attention to is, is how do you use these different or the seemingly different symptoms or different dysfunctions and maybe in looking at like where do they where do they all meet where is there a nexus where all of this would occur in the same place and then and then asking the next question which would be like is there anything that we could do that would affect how that portion works and if it did would that have an outcome that would affect all of these things and, and more often than not the cases that i attract that's what we're looking for as a solution and that's you know that's what we run into um and that came from you know like you don't come from, like, I come from a background of treating people that mostly started from brain injury, concussion, hitting their head, getting in car accidents, sports injuries. But then when you started to see was there was an overlap with these people that had an obvious injury to their brain had dysfunction in all these disparate systems. And then you would solve the problem in the brain and then all these symptoms would get better, right? So I came to it from the angle of seeing it through brain first. Yeah. And then, you know, that attracts people that say, well, I have these problems. Maybe there's something wrong with my brain that I didn't understand to start with, right? And then and that's kind of what what was born from that. Because um, I remember there was a very sort of telling moment for me about a week in or so, and I was saying something about you were observing my eyes at one point, and you said, about the cerebellum and the eyes, and then oh, you know, that's probably where you're. Well, you said to me that, oh yeah, you know, obviously, well, that's where you're getting your digestive pains from. And I said, I said to you, I said, um, you know, oh, do you, do you think so? And you said, well, I know so. So I thought because it's been, I think, one of the things. What a, a cocky thing to say. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think a lot of the me. people that um, you know knew me or known me for the last decade or so, they associate me with. A digestive problem. Sure. Um, I've had three abdominal surgeries, you know, and I've had quite a lot of sort of, you know, work done on that area. So whilst I try to explain to them I experience a lot of these other symptoms, that's where a lot of people look. But to have made that link was quite sort of a revelation for me within the first week when you pointed that out. Um, mm -hmm. Especially after we did some of the eye tests, like the uh, the Matix rod test, and it showed that my eyes weren't looking at the same target. So yeah, that's a really interesting link. Could you explain that link? Because yeah. a lot of people that follow me also have digestive issues. Well, what we're, I mean, what we're picking up there is we look at, it's something, the simple way to think about it is something working too much, too little, or just like all over the place, right? So we might call that hyperactive or hypersensitive, or we might call it hypoactive or hyposensitive, or we might call it dysmetric. Um, and that encompasses a lot of the conceptualness of it. But basically, we looked at your eyes, have the same type of problem that we see in your muscles and your body and the reflexes of your body and your posture and that correlates to the same thing we see in the blood vessels that go through your body that correlates to your digestion correlates to your breathing so like it's the same pattern in all of these systems so is it likely that they've all failed separately or is it more likely that you have this filtering generator in your brain that it's one job is to make all of those things accurate. Like, well, let's start there, especially since some of the things we're seeing. We know if you injure someone or if you take a rat and you, you poke around in that part of the brain, these things fail. So that makes it a very obvious place to start from, if that's the orientation to it that you have. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no, brilliant. Um, so if somebody is interested by being seen by a functional neurologist or chiropractic neurologist, say for logistical reasons they're unable to travel out to see the likes of yourself you know they might be halfway across the world like i was um or financially they can't kind of afford that travel and that experience or thing how can they best go and search to actually search out someone within their local area 
Yeah, so I mean, it's the thing we run into a lot. And we're, we're very lucky that a lot of people reach out from all over and it's not always a good first fit. Sometimes, so what we, what we typically do, we'll have people look up, um, there's, a, there's a locator, uh, dacme.org, where you can find people that have a training in, in chiropractic neurology or functional neurology. And that's a great place to start, especially if you've got somebody that's near you that can you know, like be involved with the, the progression of your case. We love that. And then we always make it available. Like, you know, if, if you still need another eye after that, we're always still here. And there, there are other people like us that can, that can do that. But, but start, start at home, start with what's available to you. Anything you can do that starts moving you in that direction just helps you get momentum. Yeah. You know, so I would, say, I would say the only thing to not do is don't do anything. Yeah. Like don't yeah. do anything is probably the, the worst option. Yeah. But if, as long as you're doing something that moves you forward, even if that something is like it didn't work, fine, cross it off the list, and now I now I have another direction that I can look into. But just keep moving forward. The doing nothing part. Your own, that's guaranteed not to get you anywhere. Yeah. I mean, I've found like, from looking for professionals within my local area, you can still learn things from people. Even if you don't get better, you can still learn. And, you know, this is some of the complex literature I've read over the years yeah, as well. Can. It's like maybe for some people, for a lot of people, it is a better place to start where you do actually go and see somebody who's trained in that profession already. Maybe they don't help you, but maybe you learn something about your body you didn't previously know a link between the symptoms. That you were experiencing or they point you to somebody that yeah they know and trust i mean there are a lot of great doctors that'll be like that's not my thing this person's great at it and um yeah i i understand what that feels like because i am also in the boat of like i would love to diy everything it's just the personality i have but also for some reason i'm just not i don't have the skill set in and i can't do it as fast as i would like it to do and do all the iterations of failing and starting again and failing and learning. I like that part, but there are certain things that it's probably better to just get somebody that like can really help you kind of yeah, speed yeah, up and yeah. like, get on with it. Because as fun as it is to do health stuff all the time, it's it feels better just for the better. Yeah. <laughs> so, what message would you give people out there that are basically dealing with daily debilitating and sort of unexplained symptoms? But these are also people who have this burning desire to get better, but they're just lost at the moment. Yeah. They might be one of those people that are trying to deal with lots of things. They're trying to change their diet. They're trying to introduce sort of supplement regimen. They're, you know, they're going for a certain treatment, but they're not sure how it's helping them. There's basically, there's so many things they're reaching out for and they're trying so much. They've got that sort of that passion, that desire to get well again but they just don't really know where they're at at the moment or yeah. what advice would you give to those people? That's a good question. Cause I, I obviously am biased. I come from a place of like, I want to think about how do I make something work optimally? Um, and so much of my experience has been around the fact that we have a brain that controls all these things that can heal and learn within its, within its own structure. That to me, that's really powerful. Cause like, as much as we try to manipulate a body, it's, there's so many iterations of evolution that have built this body, our bodies into what they are now that we don't really understand that well. So to say like, we should, uh, we should commandeer that and override it, doesn't feel like the best choice for most people. Um, what I think is more interesting is is taking a a curiosity to it to say how could I how could I get this to function better? How could I get this to work better? And working back from there is probably a more useful strategy than saying like, is there something I can take? Yeah. Is there something I can introduce to my body that's not kind of like oh this earth yeah, yeah that should solve this problem more often than not it's usually just to kind of cover it up so that we can hopefully like have our body get over it on its own right um so the, to me that first part is just to, having the open-mindedness to be curious about like what is what is not working in me and then working back from there to say well 
well, how could I go about getting that to work better? And if I did, what would be the outcome of that? Would that move me forward? So I know that's kind of an abstract answer. It's not a very clear, like, you should do this and this and this. But it, it's saying, like, okay, my heart rate's high. Something's not working right. What would, what would have to be not working right for my heart rate to get high? And then solving backwards from there. And most people probably don't have an expertise to, to do that, and I get that. But it doesn't make it not true. So it's still where we have to operate from, would be finding, like, what's not working? Can I find the absolute smallest level of underlying pathology to that? And can I, can either I myself or can I reach out? Can I borrow a brain? Can I borrow someone's brain that might know how to solve this problem better? There's so much access to things on YouTube. Like, people are happy to give things away for free. I'm happy to talk about things for free online because I want people to be curious about the fact that like maybe there are more options than I'm currently aware of. Yeah. And then open the door to, to seeking out other brains and other people that can think about problems too. So anything that's relative to, to the brain, to neurons, to nerves, the, you, cannot, you cannot just introduce oxygen and like give it more fuel and then it does the things it's supposed to do. You cannot just introduce glucose and it will just get better. You have to stimulate it. So the only way to heal or to grow a neuron is to use it, to stimulate it, to do something. There's an action to that. Yeah. And then if you do something, that neuron actually reaches back to the system and demands energy. It reaches back and pulls in the oxygen, it pulls in the glucose, right? So from my perspective, the, the doing is the part that matters. So you just have to learn about well, what are the things I have to do? What, what do I need to train myself to do? Do I need, to, you know, if you want to get, if you want to be able to bench 300 pounds, I don't know what that is in stone. But, <laughs> <Don't know either. laughs> but if I want to do that, there's, there's a linear path to that. I do a little bit and a little bit more and a little bit more until I get there. I do the thing. Anything that comes with the brain, you have to do the thing to stimulate the neuron. That's what makes it grow. Yeah. Um, so there's an action to healing that I think is really important. Yeah. So you, you mentioned a moment ago about your, you do bits on YouTube. I was just wondering yeah. for the people watching this now, um, where they can find you and the, the type of things you talk about in the videos and sort of what platforms you're on. Sure. Um, I'm not very good at any of it, but um, I like YouTube because people can search for things and find what they're looking for. So if if they don't want to hear me rant about a particular thing, they can, they can just search for it. So YouTube, I have, I think the name is, is Doc Kaiser, um, spelled like my last name. And then I have the same handle on Instagram and Facebook and those things. And it's all, yeah, I just, I just try to put things on there that I think will be valuable to people that are, that are suffering. I'll make sure I put the links in the, the description <laughs> of this video as well, just so people can find it. I appreciate that. Hopefully I'll, I'll keep up with it. Yeah, no, for sure. Please do, because it was, you know, from you making appearances on the Carrick Institute um, YouTube channel, some of your case studies that you spoke about on there and also your stuff on your own channel. That was what originally got me curious about coming to see you and sort of believing that this could work. So. Yeah, actually, I think it's very valuable to, to people watching and sort of hopefully with the video similar to what I'm putting together now, videos like, videos like that can start to show people a different pathway that they've never come across before. And I really, truly believe a lot of functional neurology, what we've sort of gone through over the, these last few weeks is like that. It feels like a, a shortcut almost in like, a you know, when you play like video games and there's like a racetrack and shortcut how once you, when you find it, you always take that turning and you never go around the long sort of main way because you, you see it, it's something that suddenly sort of clicks in your mind that actually I am, or I have disregarded my brain a lot. You know, what is the role of my brain? It is that control center. It's almost like the mothership for or the motherboard for the function of all the other organs. And until I actually, you know, noticed that from reading some of that com complex literature and from watching the likes of yourself and other people as well online, I suddenly realized that, yeah, this is the place I need to explore a bit deeper. And yeah, just, you know, I just want to say, really, I want to end this by saying just thank you so much for, you know, sort of 
agreeing to come, you know, for me to be seen by you and assessing and just like, it's, it's been an amazing experience and, um, you know, even documenting on these videos before on this, you know, this case study, well, the case study, this sort of vlog that I'm making, you know, about my trip here is just sort of, it's, it's eye-opening, it's sort of, it's quite emotional really because, you know, I've documented for probably about, well, there's, seven years worth of the same old symptoms you know that's a couple of thousand days and then within sort of one hundredth of that 20 odd days it's like you know everything's at least half if not more with the symptoms and it's giving me that opportunity and the fact that this is only the very start of it is it's sort of truly very exciting and to return back home to sort of people you know that i know and people that i love and and being able to sort of share this experience with them and just hopefully share, share myself with them again with sort of who I originally was. I really think that, you know, they'll, you know, it will change everybody's life for the better back home as well. So I, I am truly very grateful for your knowledge and the ex, you know, your expertise and for the team here as well, because everybody has just been so lovely and you, you never rush people, you work with the patient's pace, you know, the, the exercises are so tailored to us and, and you know, you introduce the breaks in between, you're closely monitoring, but you also, you're never disregarding, you're always sort of validifying our, our thoughts, our symptoms and our struggles. You're never sort of palming them off as nothing, as being nothing, because, you know, you and the rest of the team, I'm sure you understand that, you know, you've, you've been there yourself, you know, you've had struggles yourself as well. So yeah, I just want to say a massive thank you for that. And it's, it's been a privilege come here and to be seen by you and hopefully I can do something to help other people via this process as well so no thank you very much mate. I really do appreciate the time thank you I, we were from the team I have a wonderful team they make everything happen but um, yeah thank you for being here thanks for, for sharing your story thank, thank you. you no I really do appreciate it thank you so much <laughs> oh, of course Right, so I join you back from sunny UK. This was originally meant to be the week four update, but due to there being a very busy week four for me over in the States, and of course the flight was at the end of the week and there was issues with the flights, which I'll get onto in just a moment, um, I've had to delay this video by a week. And if anything, that gives me um, a bit more information to go by because I've had a week extra in the States following Dr. Kaiser and his team's treatment. And then also a week back here in the UK. Um, so if you're wondering why I'm a little bit out of breath filming this, it's because I've just been on a 40 minute car journey and then I've just walked into some woods, which has some pretty uneasy and unstable terrain, shall we say. Um, so it's taken my breath a little bit, but I'm going to try my best to recollect and film this video if I can. So week four was interesting, um, in a good way. Again, off the back of week three, I just did so much. Even though the treatment finished at Dr. Kaiser's clinic, I still went into his office every single day, apart from one, I believe, to use the stepping machine there. Um, and I got up to about 10, to between 10 and 12 minutes on it. Um, so yeah, that was really, really positive, um, breaking out of sweat every day. Um, and on top of that, we drove into Chelsea quite a lot to go to the cafes and just do other bits and pieces there. Um, we went to a, pra a place called the Creature Conservancy, which is a place that held a lot of very interesting animals, a bit like a zoo, but they looked after the animals that were unable to live in the wild. Um, yeah, what else did we do? We went on a couple of trips out to supermarkets. We went to um, some distillery on the final day to have sort of cocktails. And then, of course, we had the interviews with Dr. Kaiser and Dr. Keepros. And by the way, just how amazing were those two at those interviews? Um, they just offered such words of wisdom. I just really, really appreciate their time. And just everything, every bit of information they gave was just so valuable. And they're genuinely two of the nicest human beings I've ever had the pleasure of meeting and, you know, being treat treated by them has just been another experience altogether. So I'm so grateful. And one thing I really learned, one thing I feel they both really offered me and 
one thing actually they both mentioned in their interviews was this idea of building up evidence for you, especially when you've been ill with chronic illness for such a period of time, and especially when it's got really bad to the point where you've been housebound. And why I think this is really interesting is because, yes, I'm home. Yes, I've done really well up to this point from where I was a month ago. However, there's a long journey ahead and there's a lot of obstacles in my way, um, both physically, of course, um, but also mentally, because, you know, if you've gone through anywhere close to the experiences I've gone through, you find it hard to trust your body and your body's capabilities and a lot of environments will trigger you and you wonder if you're actually able to overcome them. So, you know, very soon I might look for some sort of coach to help me to gradually basically get me comfortable exposing myself to the world again, um, you know, in terms of going out places, doing things that I never thought possible. Um, but yeah, it's all about having these little wins, one win on top of another win. And just looking back, you know, looking back a month ago, in my case, and just seeing how much more I'm able to do. But I, do, I must stress this point that, like, I am not 100% fit now by any means. As I spoke about with Dr. Keepros in the interview, it's like, you know, you're going to the gym. And for me, this is just the very start of it. I think another point I spoke about with Dr. Kaiser early on in the treatment is it's a little bit like what these guys have given me is if you can imagine painting your life on a canvas so exactly how you want it where you want things what these guys have given me is the canvas they've given me the foundation and it's now up to me to try to build on that to grow with that and I, I personally believe this is the reason why so many people struggle with chronic illness and never get better is because they're never given that canvas. They're painting in midair and they're not able to put any of the pieces together for, for their life. And the reason for that is because they have no stability. Their autonomic nervous system isn't balanced. It's not under control. And as a result, they're basically fighting against automatic symptoms in their body that are happening unbeknownst to their own consciousness. And... You know, it's like, like Dr. Kaiser said in his interview, you're trying to wrestle your body into submission by trying these sort of hundreds, these thousands of things that you've read about online, things you're trying to do. Um, but ultimately, the body is in charge and it will dictate what you do in a day. Um, and it always goes for that sort of capacity that it can do and efficiency. So, yeah, I learned a lot from those guys on the interviews. Um, like I said, on top of all the other things, you know, that took a lot out of me planning the questions and actually going for those interviews. And then there was obviously the exercising, like I said before, Preacher Conservancy, the cafes. Um, we walked a couple of times, me and my brother, down to a place called The Point, which was a fair distance away in my terms of what I'm able to do from the accommodation we were staying at. Um, and one of the times it was really cold, so that really tested my sort of temperature dysregulation and my inability to um, handle cold environments. So yeah, that was a challenge for me. Um, that was This was on that week four, by the way. So I was basically discharged from the clinic, but I was doing all these other things on top of coming back into the clinic to exercise on that stepping machine. Um, and then, yeah, we got to the end of the week and I was really sort of prepared for the flight, shall we say, on the way back. Um, I slept really well the night before, and the flight was meant to be at 7 p.m. on the Friday night. And so earlier in the day, we got a message saying it had been delayed till 10 p.m. that night. So we left the accommodation later than we planned. And then we got to the airport, handed in, handed in all our baggage, and um, then we got another message saying that the flight had been cancelled to the next day at 7 p.m., so 24 hours change. And basically the reason for that was maintenance issues with the plane. So completely throw my routine out. It was almost like another challenge for me. We had to get a, get a hotel. Luckily we got a hotel that was quite decent. It was, it was about eight miles away from the airport. Stayed the night there. Again, another challenge for me. Um, came back the next day and flew and the next flight, the, the, the flight the next day was all successful. Um, and 
yeah, I didn't have any issues on the plane um, until the last half an hour when the pilot said that we were entering a lot of turbulence in and around sort of UK, sort of London region. And yeah, I had a water bottle next to me that had didn't have any water in it, but it basically like shriveled up. And I started really feeling a lot of pressure in my head and like my skull and like I couldn't breathe very well. And then I felt better after we landed, obviously. And then later that day, I had, I had a couple of nosebleeds. So obviously my body still has this sort of issue with like pressure and then it's sort of relieving itself. Um, but yeah, so we arrived back home Sunday morning, local time here in, in the UK. Um, and yeah, since I've been home, just been going on little, loads of little walks at random times during the day, things I never did eating every one of my meals at the dinner table um if you guys didn't know which you, you probably didn't for the last seven years i've eaten every one of my meals sat up sat under a coffee table because even being sat upright just makes it so uncomfortable to eat and to breathe and i just can't manage it so to have eaten like three meals a day all of the dinner table for the last week has been sort of a massive win in my eyes um i've also spoken to people basically every single day um, and these come at different parts of the day, so different challenges. Some people speaking speaking to me while I'm eating breakfast and other meals. Um, I've been going out in, in the evenings. Um, I visited my best mate and I walked to his house as opposed to sort of I always get dropped off there. Um, and then I spoke for, you know, a few hours, walked back home again. Um, that would be a situation where the next day I'd feel really uncomfortable. But instead, what did I do? I went out the following, following, following evening to see my brother and his mates and spent the evening there. So yeah, it's just been really positive in terms of transitioning where I was in America to where I am now back home. Um, but of course, I'm also dealing with like the jet lag and getting to sleep at sort of weird times. So it's like a transition period, but I hope to really build on this. Um, but we'll see as time goes by. So yeah. Um, and again, I'm out during the day, something I never used to really do. I used to sort of go for one walk or one small cycle if I was very lucky in the evenings um, before this whole trip. And I just find myself being more and more restless during each day. Like I want to go out and I want to push the push the boat out a bit, push the boundaries and see what I can do. And then I actually feel like I'm genuinely getting tired when it gets to the evening time. So yeah, it's been really positive even back in the UK now, although I must say, I do prefer where we were living in Chelsea quite a lot more than the UK. Just there's just so many things I prefer about it, but got to get back, got to get used to it back here now. And yeah, I'm really excited to see what's in store for me moving into the future. Um, and I'm just so grateful. I'm so grateful for the team in Chelsea finally to be listened to to be heard, to be assessed, diagnosed and treated all in one. It's just been an unreal experience and I just can't thank the team there enough for what they've given me. Um, and I really hope in turn to get myself back up to full fitness and then offer whatever I can to help to put people on the right pathway to get their lives in check as well because there's a lot of time spent, there's a lot of energy spent, there's a lot of frustration in trying to get your life back on track. And I understand this as much as the next person out there and it's just been an eye-opening experience for me and I'm just so appreciative for it so that'll be the end of this video but I do plan on filming one more for this vlog um, and I'll join you on it very soon it'll be me going over the symptoms I experienced prior to this trip and whether they've improved or not and hopefully some of you might be able to relate a bit more so with my experiences coming into this and really get a feel for whether you might be somebody with sort of autonomic issues as well and these problems you can't really gain control over and whether you might need to be somebody who you know might need to be assessed yourself because you can't really like I said gain any sort of control or momentum over your life so you can't progress and you can't move forward and you can't do what you'd really like to do so yeah that'll be coming up very shortly as well so yeah from me, I'm sort of tired, I'm exhausted because I've just walked down this sort of, this kind of woodland pathway to film this video, but I feel, feel good, I feel 
happy. I feel I can finally build on something, but this is going to take time. So yeah, just really looking forward to the future and seeing what it brings. So I thought a telling way to end this vlog would be to film a video in the exact same room that I started the vlog in. The only difference this time around being that I'm sat in a desk chair, whereas at the beginning of this video I was perched up against a sofa bed, sort of lied out on the floor, and I just didn't have any of the resources to speak about my symptoms, which is what I really wanted to do towards the beginning. But actually as the video went on, I sort of got the impression that I thought it would be more appropriate to talk about the symptoms and how the experience have, has actually had an impact on them, whether it's improved them, which symptoms it's improved more so than others. And yeah, I'm just going to get straight into it. And I'm afraid I've got a notepad with me, so I'm going to be looking a lot at this while I'm filming this video. And I've broken the symptoms down into kind of categories and then sort of subcategories. So the first symptom that I know that has been living with me, you know, been part of me for the last seven years since I got really bad back in 2016, is orthostatic intolerance, so this inability to stand upright. And so with that, I had a fast heart rate. My heart would get anywhere between about 100 beats per minute, up to about 140, I believe, on the test I did in the clinic. Um, and with that, my blood pressure would actually increase, you know, upon standing. So it would probably go from like 110 over something to 150 over something just by standing. And so did that improve when I was at the clinic? Well, I did a tilt table test from 0 to 60 degrees towards the end of the test, towards the end of the uh, treatment. And that resulted in a less than 10 beats per minute change between supine, so lying, and that sort of upright position at about 60 degrees. And I just feel sort of more easy being upright since I've returned back home. Um, one thing I noticed when I was upright before is the fact that I was feeling almost panicky because I had these symptoms of, you know, as we found out in the interviews and, and as, you know, with my results and everything, that blood was dropping out of my head. So, of course, I was going to feel panicky being upright. And now I feel more like it's a fatigue when I'm stood upright, almost like, you know, like I've got to train that sort of system again, that reflex, those muscles that will contribute to actually keeping blood in your head. So I feel a bit more fatigued standing up as opposed to panicky, but fatigued in a way like if you were going to go and, you know, have a jog around the block and, you know, you hadn't trained at all in terms of running, you're going to run out of breath pretty quickly. And that's how I feel standing up, but it's definitely improved and it's clinically improved as well with those actual results. So, so the, the thing under orthostatic intolerance I've also written is that I felt lightheaded every time I stood up and like I was going to pass out or faint. Again, I link this onto the point I just mentioned. I don't feel as panicky stood up like these things are going to happen, but I feel like I'm in the very early days of reconditioning that system. So I've basically got to take things gradually. I've noticed I've been going out for more walks at random times during each day. I'm spending more time of a day on my feet, and I've just got to build up that system very gradually and you know work it every day as best I can. But the facts are you're not going to go from being pretty much sort of on the floor for 90 to 95 percent of every day to standing for three or four hours a day it's just not going to happen it's going to need gradual reconditioning so i also experienced a lot of shortness of breath when i stood up and i actually struggled to put sentences together and speak to somebody when i was stood up again i'm going to link that into what i just said it's improving i was definitely upright a lot more towards the final two weeks at the clinic over in the states and I've been talking a lot more to people since I've been back home as well. But again, it's been more so the case of I feel more comfortable talking seated than standing. I think we're just working multiple different systems at once and the body just needs gradual training. But I've got that stability. I've got that foundation. So again, that's just going to have to be another thing that gradually improves over time. I also noticed that my vision went a bit more out of focus when I was talking, when I was stood upright as well. So when I was stood upright. I noticed my vision, you know, went a little bit blurry and it just wasn't as focused as when I was lying on the floor. Again, I think I've come to learn that it's because blood and fuel was basically dropping out of my head when I was stood upright. So, of course, I was going to be in this situation where my body wasn't going to like it. My eyes weren't going to be able to focus. I spoke with Dr. Kipros in the interview all about this. And so, of course, my vision was going to be off. 
And yeah, it's just another thing that has just massively improved with the orthostatic training and, you know, the baroreceptor sensitivity improving with the rehabilitation, but also with those visual exercises. And I've actually transitioned them from the clinic into actually doing them back home at least three times a day. So I was also never able to stand for more than 10 minutes at any time. And I'd have to be walking around and not stationary, like basically stood up at one in one position. I probably couldn't be stood up in one position for more than about two or three minutes. Um, but when I did manage to walk around, it would be for 10 minutes. And that would only be once a day, usually in the evenings. Maybe twice if I was lucky, but that would be off the back of feeling really bad. Or if I did that, it would then make me feel really bad later on in the day or the following day. So yeah, this is just improved. Like, you know, I basically, I'm walking around, I'm sit, sat up most of a day now, as opposed to lying down on the floor. But all the other times I'm sort of walking around the house, I'm going for walks at random times during a day. I'm helping more with sort of washing up, drying, you know, I'm performing my exercise and I'm like walking around while I'm doing them. So it's, you know, a case more so of, I'm, I'm just sort of, I feel, as I spoke to Dr. Kaiser about as well, I feel a bit more restless, like when I'm sat down for longer periods of time. I want to get up on my feet. I want to walk around. Even that, if that's just for five or 10 minutes, like that is a massive improvement from where I used to be before this whole process. So I also noticed I got purple colored hands and feet, um, especially when standing up. And, you know, if I got out of a bath or a shower, they'd be sort of a very deep red slash sort of purple color, my feet especially. Um, I've noticed now if I get out of like a hot bath or something, they'll still be that same color but I've noticed they don't really go that color at all just when I'm standing anymore. So that's just a massive kind of clinical sign. You can see from these visuals, you know, I had this problem for seven years, but before those seven years, I noticed I never had the, the purple hands, purple feet. I've learned about why it's come about, why it's happening. And, you know, we've improved it during the time of the clinic. And, you know, that's just one of the visual kind of signs I've actually seen improve along with a lot of these other symptoms as well. So, I also noticed I experienced a lot of lot more digestive symptoms when I was stood upright, like following being stood upright. It's almost like standing was putting like pressure on my body, and then suddenly later on in the day I'd be lying out on the floor and I'd be getting kind of a lot more trapped gas, trapped air, and I'll just be suffering a hell of a lot more, you know, in the digestive department. Again, that's just really improved the fact that I'm walking around more but also I'm not having to lie on the floor and I'm able to be sat up and the digestion has just improved considerably as I'll go on to in just a moment. So the, the first thought that always entered my mind when standing was that I need to lie down. When can I lie down? And that was almost instantaneous every time I stood upright. Straight away, let's lie down. If I was out in public, I always used to panic because I wanted to know when I could lie down, when the soonest I could lie down was. And I almost didn't want to appear to look strange like I was in a public place and I needed to lie down somewhere. Um, yeah, that's not the case anymore. Um, I feel a lot more sort of calm, relaxed when I go places. Um, you know, the fact that I can sit down now as opposed to lie down for majority of a day just improves that a considerable amount. So yeah, that's not the first thought that comes into my mind when I stand up. But as, as I mentioned before, I still feel like I'm fatiguing quite quickly after standing. Like I might manage like a 15 or 20 minute walk on my feet at any one given moment, but I'll be doing that multiple times in a day. So yes, yeah, definitely improved in that department. And I definitely don't feel like I need to lie down nearly as much as, as I previously did. I also felt a very heavy feeling in my legs when I stood up like it was almost like blood was accumulating in my legs and they just felt very heavy, almost like tree trunks, like I was walking with tree trunks. And I didn't feel much blood sort of in my torso and in my head, you know, and in my shoulders and in my arms. And obviously we come to learn that that's because I had this blood flow distribution issue when I was stood up, you know, I actually had blood dropping out of my head and the reflexes and the systems weren't able to keep it in that area. So a lot of it did drain down. So yeah, that feeling has drastically improved along with, of course, you know, the clinical testing and the results we found out that now that I'm upright, more blood is actually remaining in the upper part of my body. 
So yeah, my legs don't feel as heavy, which is what I feel like they should be feeling because I remember feeling fit and healthy in my teenage years. I definitely didn't notice my legs as much when I was stood up. So yeah, it's just absolutely brilliant. It's got back to that point. Um, I also felt like my arms would tire very quickly or fatigue very quickly if I like held them up in front of me like this sort of thing for any period of time. Again, that's just another part that's improved, although I haven't really been doing anything as much with my arms out like that. I also noticed that if I walked around for a bit, I would get a very tight feeling at the back of my neck or like a dull ache in the, in my lower spine. I've noticed this a little bit since I've come back, especially when I'm walking for longer periods. I do get a bit of tightness in the neck still. But again, I think that's just a case of if I keep improving these systems, if I work on strengthening them, as I spoke with Dr. Kaiser, if I chase the symptoms and build up my resistance and endurance, then hopefully over time the body should get more used to this way of life and those neck problems should hopefully, you know, go go to some extent. So I want to transition from orthostatic intolerance into digestive issues now, but one point I think that's really important to note, and this is sort of a link between the two that I've noticed, is that I spend over 90% of each day, probably closer to 95% of each day, lying on my side, whether that was my left-hand side or my right-hand side. Because I just didn't feel comfortable sat up, I felt like I couldn't take a genuine deep breath in. I always felt like I was sort of obstructed with air and my lungs couldn't fully sort of inflate to actually take in air. Also, you know, I felt like blood was dropping out of my head when I was in that position. Not even just standing, but just seated. And, you know, lying on my side was the only way I felt I could alleviate it. And we've gone from spending 90% of each day lying on my side on the floor to basically some days I'm not lying on my side or I'm not even lying on the floor entirely for the entirety of the day so that is just I mean what a, what a difference that is um, you know I'm seated like I am now for the majority of most days now and I'm going on these sort of occasional walks around the house or like up the road so yeah just such a massive change such a massive improvement so moving on to digestive issues so to me, it felt like I had a permanently slow bowel and slow bowel motility. And that would end up causing me plenty of sort of belching, bloating, constipation, reflux, trapped gas and breathing difficulties. So if you guys have watched the vlog up to this point, you'll note that on week two, my week two update, I noticed a lot of issues in these departments as well. Um, they felt like they were ongoing and they were never going anywhere. All of these have just improved just a considerable amount. Um, you know, I, I just can't really explain enough how weird it is to be doing more, to be exercising, to be walking around, to be seated, as opposed to just lying on the floor doing nothing, to still be eating the same foods, but getting considerable less of these symptoms every single day. Um, yeah, it's just a strange paradox, and I'm just so pleased that most of those symptoms have dropped off without me needing to take meds or change anything about my diet at all. Um, almost all the time, the only way I would feel alleviation from these symptoms would be to lie on my side on the floor, sometimes for multiple hours at a time. And then eventually what would happen is I'd get sort of air come through the stoma that I live with, the ileostomy, and then I would feel a little bit of relief. But sometimes I'd have to wait hours for that to happen. And like I said to you before, guys, I'm not lying on my side on the floor really at all within a day now and you know I'm not having to alleviate these symptoms because these symptoms aren't really coming very much in the first place so they've all improved and it's allowed me sort of the license to sort of stand up to move around to you know stay seated as opposed to lying and I'm not having to do that and it's just such a nice feeling the only thing I've noted when it comes to this is if I go a little bit too long without eating a meal I notice later in the evenings I get sort of a ball of air that's a bit stuck in me that doesn't feel as comfortable as it used to but still feels a little bit unpleasant at times until that passes you know I'm sort of then able to get to sleep and feel a little bit more comfortable um so I've had three abdominal surgeries and I was continuously told the feelings of sluggish motility and obstructions were due to scar tissue 
So this is an interesting point because Dr. Kaiser also picked up on sort of scar tissue when he was doing one of his tests on me. Um, you know, and I am I am working every now and then on having using an exercise to gradually break down that scar tissue. But I would say that, you know, a lot of this bowel motility has improved without me actually doing that very much at all. It's really the sort of the baro reflex sensitivity improvement, the eye training exercises, the vestibular rehab. All of those things have basically fed into improving my digestive motility. And I've not had to think about that much at all. So I do wonder how much or how little scar tissue actually plays a role in some of these digestive symptoms I get. But even so, it's all improved. Um, I haven't felt any feelings of obstructions as such. I just sometimes feel a little bit of trapped air in there and it makes things a little bit unpleasant at times, just especially in the evenings, really. So certain foods would cause me to have worse digestive symptoms, but eating nothing also caused tons of digestive pains. So this is a really interesting one, the symptom I got, because I noticed every time I started introducing like new foods, my body would have a bad reaction to them. So originally, I thought a lot of my digestive symptoms were down to, you know, foods and diet. However, when I was in hospital seven years ago, I went nil by mouth, which meant, which meant I didn't eat anything. I was told not to eat anything for 10 days. And during those 10 days, I actually got worse digestive symptoms when I wasn't eating anything. So that sort of told me back then, because I have that sort of evidence to back me up, that foods weren't the cause of this. Foods were not the cause of my digestive pains. And, you know, I've learned a lot more about the constriction now with regards to the digestive tract and blood sort of being taken away from it, blood, you know, blood vessels constricting. And then as a result, you just hope, don't have these enzymes being released. The food just isn't broken down as well. It's in there for longer. It causes more gas and other symptoms. And yeah, so again, you know, I've just got back home and I've eaten pretty much any food and every food out there. So yeah, just really enjoying not having to change my diet but the digestive symptoms improving as a result of the sort of the therapy and the rehabilitation that I've gone through. Um, so I have an ileostomy or stoma, whatever you want to call it. And since I got bad seven years ago, the output changed to the output changed to being very disjointed. There'd be none and then there'd be loads. So there'd be like none and then there'd be air and lots of output, which was sort of like a tar slash slimy consistency. Um, and I lived for about a year with a stoma when the output was very healthy, I, I believe. This was when a lot of the markers were a lot more in check, like the um, CRP and fecal calprotectin levels. And then when I had that sort of event happen to me seven years ago, every single day, from that point for over seven years the output was strange it was like like my digestive system was more unsettled like you know it like i had a bad stomach continuously and matched with that was also a lot of these markers that had increased like the fecal calprotectin was always in the hundreds if not the thousands i think the maximum my got mine got to was about three and a half thousand but it had never gone to within normal levels over the period of seven years so and I haven't had a fecal calprotectin test since I've been back, but I'd be really interested to do one because I just feel like the output has thickened up. It's sort of a lighter colour, like what it used to be like when I was fitter and healthier with a stoma, when I went on holiday with one, when I was learning to drive and I drove places with one, when I used to play football with one. So yeah, and you know, went to university with it as well. So I did a lot with a stoma in the first year that I originally got one. And it's really nice to see after seven years, the sort of output start to be like what it used to be. So I also mentioned this in the last video I filmed, but I ate meals sat under a coffee, coffee table for seven years because being sat in the position I'm sat up now, I couldn't breathe properly. So I actually couldn't really swallow my food very well and eat at a dinner table. Um, and then I would say the last two to three weeks i've had every single meal so some in the states and back here in the uk now had every single meal sat at a dining table and that's just been an amazing thing for me just an amazing thing to sort of be sociable again while eating food it's just been just been a joy been a pleasure to actually do that as opposed to sort of sit there and you know struggle to make my way through meals i'm actually enjoying meals now with my family so after every meal i used to have to wait 
at least an hour, if not longer, to let the food go down in order to speak to anyone. So I'd be sat there and it would almost be like the food was sat up here and it wouldn't allow me to breathe, to talk. And I'd almost have to sort of go into this like Zen, Zen state to sort of block out any noise around me of what people were saying. I, I couldn't open my mouth to speak because it would, it would basically cause more digestive upsets. That lasted for like an hour or more. And, you know, what am I doing now? I'm sat at a dining table and I'm eating, I'm laughing and I'm joking with the people I'm speaking to while I'm eating my meal, you know, at exactly the same moment. So just a huge improvement. Again, I'm not having to wait an hour. I'm not having to wait five minutes. I'm talking while I'm eating and yeah, I can't believe it. Genuinely can't believe it. Uh, multiple times during each day, I would feel blocked. And when that happened, I'd be unable to talk, sit up, stand, eat, and I'd struggle to breathe normally, this feeling would only improve once stuff came through the stoma and left my body. So that's basically what I mentioned earlier. I had all these bad symptoms at once, and I'd have to lie on my side for multiple hours in order to hope the feeling would relieve itself, and usually it would. But now it's like the feeling isn't coming originally anywhere near the, to the extent it was. So I'm not even having to lie on my side to relieve the symptoms. So again, it's just improved dramatically in that department. I've also been diagnosed with Crohn's, uh, well, I've been diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, but Crohn's disease has never been ruled out, and that's since 2013. So, again, with the raised fecal calprotectin levels, I'll be really interested. Maybe I'll save it for a future video where I actually have that tested again and seeing, see if the inflammation has dropped off considerably, because I can tell you what, it really does feel like it has dropped off. Shortness of breath. I felt short of breath every moment of every day for over seven years. And actually, every single video I made prior to this one on my channel, I had to clip it in between about, I don't know, 20 to 30 second segments because I've always had to recollect my, you know, my breath and then go again. And there's been videos where I've actually had to film them multiple days apart because you know, I actually couldn't complete filming like a, a 10 to 15 minute video within a single day. Um, as you can probably tell from some of these videos I'm filming now, it's like, it, it's mental. You know, I'm I just, Yes, I do feel short of breath at some moments during some days, usually after, you know, doing exercise or eating something, or if I'm talking for a while like I am now. But I mean, it's just improved just to a ridiculous extent. Um, Whenever I talk, I'd always had have to take a breath in, in between each sentence, and sometimes in between words of a sentence as well. So I'd say something, and then I'd be like, and then I'd have to resume that sentence. Um, this is why filming videos for me prior to this one was just almost impossible. Impossible, but I still wanted to show up every day. I still wanted to try my best to get the content out. Um, as you can tell, I am haven't been able to, I haven't, sorry, I haven't been in this situation where I've had to take in multiple breaths in between sentences since I've been filming this vlog, which has just been another area that's just improved drastically. I always felt like I had to pick between breathing and talking. Um, I think it's really interesting we learn a little bit about the cerebellum um, at my time at Dr. Kaiser's clinic about how my cerebellum was perhaps undertrained on one side, not quite working as it should be. And a lot of the cerebellum's function is to help the body execute multiple actions at once. And so having, for me, having to pick between choosing to breathe or talk, that should be something that's automatic and natural, but it's actually a complex um, execution that the body has to go through. Um, and as you can probably tell me recording these videos, it's like I'm talking and I'm breathing in between talking, but I'm sort of doing it more effortlessly than at the very start. Um, so yeah, another thing that's just improved. I could never take a deep breath in without it feeling like it was disrupted by trapped air and intestinal dilation. So basically one thing I could never do is go like this. And actually feel like I, I could I one thing I could never do is like inflate my lungs sort of fully and take a full breath in 
And I think I remember back to the week one update. I was I was there like a couple of days before I filmed that video. I was sat next to the lake and I just took a deep breath in of that sort of that natural air um, by Lake Cavana. And I just couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe for the first time in seven years, you think every single moment of every day for seven years, I hadn't been able to take that breath in because I'd breathe a little bit and then there'd be like something that would stop me having to stop me being able to breathe more and I'd have to then deflate and go again and as a result of that I was breathing a lot within a minute and yeah that just wasn't the way of it wasn't the way to live um, again another automatic function that I had no control over and it was ruling my life and luckily it's just one of the many things that improved during this process <laughs> Another big one for me was temperature dysregulation. So I believe my temperature, I haven't checked it yet, but I believe my temperature prior to the time over in Chelsea, Michigan, was almost always about one degree lower than probably the optimum human temperature. So mine would probably be about 35.7, 35.5 degrees centigrade. Um, and I believe it's sort of meant to be about 36 and a half to sort of 37, that range. So again, I think that the result of why that was low, lower was just because my metabolism was slow because my body was sort of in a state of not the optimum state, shall we say. So I'm yet to test this metric, but I believe in myself it's improved. Um, so I struggled massively with hot, in, hot and cold environments. In the heat, I would get hot frasly an electric feeling skin i felt nauseous lightheaded and felt like i was about to faint so it was like this feeling was sort of it was a horrible feeling sometimes you get it when you start ex well i started to when i you know exercise before this process it's what i would get within the first minute or so of exercising and yeah it was just sort of a horrible horrible feeling and yeah i'd get it in the hot weather pretty much instantly when i was exposed to the sun um, this is one thing that I'm not sure has improved. I, I'd like to think it's improved. Um, but the only problem was I think we had nice weather the first week we were out in Chelsea, Michigan. And then we entered that time of the year where it was like end of October, beginning of November time. Um, sorry, end, sorry, beginning of October, sort of to mid-October time. And then we never really got hot weather after that. So there was never really an opportunity to test whether I improved in that department. But one thing Dr. Kaiser did say is once you start sweating again during exercise, your body should be able to adjust to various temperatures much easier. Um, and I certainly found being in certain sort of warm cafe environments and just other environments where I would, would have felt warm, where I would have felt like I'd have to take my, my jumper off because I felt too hot. I felt like I haven't had to do that. So that's just a massive plus for me. But I'll have to wait till the next summer to really try this one out to see if it works um in cold i would feel panicky and much colder than everyone else and i'd always breathe heavily and rapidly so you know if somebody was joining me on a walk out in an evening one time they might just be in a coat and i'd be in a coat sort of a scarf a woolly hat gloves thermal bottoms thermal top i just couldn't handle it and you know if we were out for you know i could probably handle like five minutes but if I was out for any longer than that, I'd just have like an instant sort of panic attack in the cold. Again, this this is one thing that I definitely feel has improved because when I walked to my mate's house last week, I was just wearing a coat, a jumper and a coat. And about two thirds of the way to his house, I actually noticed that I could see sort of my breath in the sort of the evening, you know, in the evening mist. I could see my breath leaving my mouth, meaning that it was quite a cold evening. I didn't feel too cold, so I definitely think that has, that has improved from what I've observed. In hot weather, it felt like blood and heat was drawn to the surface of my skin, causing purple hands and purple feet. However, I couldn't really sweat, so the heat was contained inside me. This is what it felt like. This is why it was so uncomfortable to be out in hot conditions. And this is why I spoke about with Dr. Kipros in the interview as well, how blood when constriction happens blood moves to the peripheral of the body so that's what ends up causing these purple hands and purple feet and as a result for me what ended up happening is because i couldn't sweat at the time because you know it took me until week 
three, the end of week three to sort to start sweating, this heat would be contained inside inside me. So if I started entering temperatures outside where it would be like 20, 25 degrees plus, I'd just feel so uncomfortable and so much hotter than everyone else and I wouldn't be able to sweat. So it sort of makes perfect sense why I would feel panicky in those environments, why I would feel lightheaded and like I was going to faint and why I needed to find shade somewhere and cool down and, and drink plenty of water. My skin would also become very sore, dry and flaky, especially on the soles of my feet and behind my ears. Something I've noticed that has improved, you know, behind my ears, they feel absolutely fine now. Soles of my feet, I think they're much better than what they were. Again, I think this has just become, just, just as a result of, you know, me exercising, sweating, getting that temperature regulation in better check. It's just improved alongside literally everything else. Exercising was something I could barely do. As I mentioned a moment ago, the blood would sit under my skin and make me hot and nauseous, but I wouldn't be able to sweat to cool down. Also, I could barely stand up or even sit down. And, you know, you, you, know, you guys saw me on the, um, the stepping machine earlier on in the process just a few weeks ago how I was sort of at a 45 degree angle exercising and since I've got back home we've got this sort of exercise bike where you sort of do this with your hands as well and yeah every single time I'm able to get to the point where I'm able to sweat and you know exercise the fatigue kicks in but it's good fatigue it's like you know if you're somebody who hasn't exercised for a month and you try to get back into it or I say exercise for a month you know exercise for years and you try to get back into it and you know you, you get that feeling like you you feel a little bit nauseous you feel a little bit sick once you get to a certain point but that's good that's how you're supposed to feel that's how you build up fitness because you might have one day rest and then you go again the following day and you know you might exercise for say you did eight minutes one day you might do nine the next day or you might just do eight again you know the next day and that's how you build up fitness so I actually feel like I can exercise successfully if you like because I never felt like that in the past because just everything was like I felt nervous like my my body couldn't dissipate this heat at all um, I couldn't sweat I couldn't breathe properly and I just felt nauseous and sick within moments of trying to do anything that was remotely high intensity so that has just improved just a dramatic amount moving on to personality because I think again this is something really interesting and really important to talk about because if you can sort of relate to anything I've said up to this point, you could probably start to understand how symptoms are sort of driving your personality. They're sort of forcing you to become a certain way, perhaps not the person you actually really are. So previously, I was very extroverted, loved going out, but my body had forced me to become an introvert over the past seven years. Has this improved? Well, I've spent sort of a lot of the last week since I got back home to the UK talking with people seeing friends when I was over in the States I spent plenty of time talking to the clinicians in Dr Kaiser's office also a lot of the patients as well so yeah I've been a lot more sociable and I know it's very early days but I hope that the old me is gradually coming out again you know coming back to who I originally was and yeah I do feel that's improved but I feel that's going to be a very gradual improvement as well um, as I build up fitness and just general stamina where I can sort of expose myself going out different places and environments again um, so I always felt very fragile in terms of the amount of stress I could handle if people spoke a little bit too loud or had to repeat or uh, sorry let me say that one again I always felt very fragile in terms of the amount of stress I could handle if people spoke a bit too loud or I had to repeat what I just said I would become very irritated so this is just something that I noticed over the period of the last seven years or so how the sounds when the sounds sort of came in a little bit too loud in my ears I'd have to get somebody to sort of speak quieter than what they were it really felt like it was sort of it was a big deal to me um and also because it felt so much energy to get my words out to speak to somebody if I was speaking to them and they were on their phone not listening or you know I had to repeat for any reason what I just said I'd feel sort of this inner annoyance and this frustration that they just didn't hear what I said and yeah you end up sort of like a very frustrated quite angry personality that you know you can't change how 
your feeling and you know things like that so I never felt like I had the energy to express emotion so I always came across very neutral and apathetic in my mood this is um, a really interesting one and this is something I feel has improved considerably especially that with my time um, with the team at the clinic in Chelsea as well because I was sort of interacting with them so much um, and I did feel like my old self you know came to the surface quite a few times I could laugh I could joke um, yeah like I said since I've been home it's been a similar story as well so I'm really sort of pleased that this has improved but again I think this feeling and this sort of mood set is going to improve when all the other symptoms improve over time when I manage to build my general endurance and stamina so yeah just really happy that I'm able to express emotion a bit more than I you know could previously I always felt like an observer in any social situation or events I felt like life was happening around me but that I wasn't really part of it yeah so this is something I spoke about with Dr Kaiser as well it's like you'd feel like you were in a room and other things were happening other people were interacting with one another and even when people tried to speak with you you'd feel like it wasn't really you because you couldn't let the real you come out because you just didn't have the energy you didn't have that capacity to express yourself so in the end what you wanted to do is you sort of wanted to shut away in the corner you wanted everyone else to do things and you ended up feeling like you didn't want to be in any social situation you didn't want to be out anywhere because it was just a hassle for you it was more effort for you and all you'd get you all you'd experience is other people enjoying themselves and you'd just be observing it so I definitely feel this has improved I definitely feel like I've become somebody who's happy to be in a room with other people and being part of social situations like I said before you know in the cafes in Dr Kaiser's clinics when we've gone on certain you know some of these trips where I've seen some of my mates since I returned back to the UK and just spoken to other people and it just genuinely feels you know just a lot better like I'm actually present in the moment again so I was very anxious going out and about every day if I could manage it this was heightened by if I have ever had to leave the house or if someone new was around the house or if I was expecting something like a phone call so basically any situation that would throw me out of my normal routine I would become increasingly anxious I noticed I'd get this very as I, as I spoke about before sort of itchy feeling like frazzly feeling on my skin and my behind my ears would go really red and really hot I'd end up getting this sort of purple hands purple feet my digestion would shut down um, I'd have the shortness of breath and yeah just all of those symptoms would happen to me whether it's sort of the previous you know the previous night during the evening I'd get a bad sleep and then throughout the entirety of a day and sometimes this wasn't just like the day before an event this could be like weeks or months before an event where I'd start to think about it and I'd overanalyze it this has definitely improved um, I feel if I've got anything any appointment any meeting or if somebody just decides to randomly kind of call me I'll just answer the phone now and I'll just speak and you know I'll go to the, uh, an appointment if I need to and I think part of this is really because like I said I don't have that shortness of breath as much I know I can sit down for longer periods of time not feel like feel uncomfortable and you know I know that the sort of the blood isn't dropping out of my head anymore so I feel like you know I can be part of these situations and environments and I can go to these meetings or be on these phone calls without getting these really bad symptoms and not not fearing them um I also regularly experience panic attacks especially in public places I think this links into the point I just said um but also clinically as well when I had those tests and like my eyes wouldn't line up um, you know it's, it's all about as Dr Kaiser spoke about it's all about having correct inputs so that the output is correct and in my case if my eyes aren't lined up and you know blood's dropping out of my head when I'm in that upright position and my body doesn't know where it is in regards to the space around it then it's just going to continuously have incorrect inputs and the output is going to be symptomatic symptom symptomatology in the rest of the body and so why would I want to almost go into public just to experience that feeling even if I'm you know if I'm experiencing that feeling back home why would I want to expose myself and go go into public places and feel the same thing it's just yeah so again that just improved along the course of being there because you know we went out to more public places we went to some of these cafes we went to that distillery 
Um, and of course, even in his clinic as well, I was speaking to other patients there and just being, oh, and at the airport as well, of course, airport there and back, just a lot more people around, um, you know, a lot more situations on, you know, like buses and stuff in and out of the airport. So yeah, I just yeah, never experienced a single panic attack and just felt so much better as the time went on throughout my the duration of the trip there. My personality felt like it was consumed by the symptoms I was experiencing daily. And this is something that Dr. Kaiser said to me as well, how, you know, I was never really sort of able to be in the present because I was being consumed by these symptoms. So whilst I was technically there in front of him and being assessed by him and being treated, really in the early days, what it was, it was me lying there thinking, you know, I just want this, these symptoms to pass. And I was trying to get so involved with the process but really he could tell that you know, for the last seven years, this is what my life had been. I'd never truly been able to sort of be in that moment because I was experiencing symptoms just so frequently and they were kind of causing me to become, you know, housebound and to the point where I couldn't really do anything other than lie on my side throughout the majority of every day. So really how my life was lived was it was just a bunch of distractions to distract me away from that pain until those symptoms passed to some extent to allow me to move around slightly but apart from that yeah it was just con con you know consumed by them so that's just improved so much i just can't even explain how much that's improved <clears throat> and then finally i've just kind of listed a few like miscellaneous symptoms that don't really fit into any of the other categories but are, are other things i've noticed improvements in so i noticed that i get sort of i had over the last seven years blocked sinuses in the morning and especially in the left nostril and I later found out during one of the assessments that Dr Kaiser and his team did is that the left nostril was actually sort of collapsing slightly so when he sort of turned my head to the left he noticed it sort of went in and so I couldn't actually breathe out of it properly and he told me that this is most likely due to the facial nerve innervation and sort of damage to the brain on the side so that basically it couldn't properly breathe out of that nostril so i notice if i because I, I generally sleep on my side if i slept on my right side my like left nostril would have sort of collapsed and i couldn't breathe properly and now i just i can breathe a lot more normally i don't get these sort of blocked sinuses this stuffy nose when i wake up in the morning so that's just pr improved just a dramatic amount as well recurring nosebleeds and again this is from the left nostril spe uh, left nostril specifically um, it's hard to say whether this one's improved I'd like to think this is improved but as I mentioned on the previous video about how I ended up having a nosebleed just after I got off the plane because we entered a lot of turbulence with high pressure so maybe that's a symptom that if I'm exposed to certain environments that it will trigger them still um, and there's definitely more constriction happening on that left side um, it's definitely a little bit more damage which is why we deployed the therapies we did and why they were so specifically targeted to the areas they needed to be um so fatigue of course is a big one um, i haven't mentioned it already so fatigue an afternoon slump in energy and also just naps during a day definitely one nap i definitely have one nap about i don't know six or seven p.m or maybe even earlier sort of before dinner time maybe three or four p.m not having naps at the moment you know not had one for a while now um that afternoon slump in energy has just gone i feel like it's a basically a continuous sort of flow of energy throughout the day and then we when we hit about 7 8 p.m i start to feel a little bit more tired and then when you get to sort of like 9 10 p.m i feel really tired which is sort of what a human should feel really you know that natural cycle of using your energy throughout the day and feeling tired so you can actually sleep in the evening so that's just improved dramatically because previously it was like i woke up feeling not refreshed at all I felt a little bit tired in the morning. I had a little bit of energy in the morning, but I, I completely just drop my energy levels around like 1 to 2 p.m. sort of time. And then my energy would be low all the way through to about dinner time. And I'd actually end up feeling like I had the most energy in the evening, which is when I wanted to get to sleep. So it was just a complete sort of inverse of what it should have been. I feel like that has completely turned around and just, just made my life so much better. I also never felt like I could fully empty my bladder sort of when going to the toilet, sort of I'd go for a wee and then I felt like I couldn't kind of fully, let's say fully empty it. So the fact that I went a little bit 
and you know i would need to go again like 10 minutes later and again this just made things really awkward when you're in sort of public environments and there's a lack of toilets in places this is just another thing that's just improved just so much and you know I'm really grateful that that's improved just makes going out in public a lot easier as well i used to wake up loads of times in the middle of the night to have a way to go to the toilet um and I, I, I would say I wake up maybe once or twice in the evenings now, but I don't feel like I need to leave leave my bed all the time to actually go to the toilet. So again, that's just another thing that's just definitely improved. It's just amazing how many symptoms have improved in, in tandem to one another. Um, I was very irritable to lights and sounds, so bright lights or flashing lights, slightly louder sounds. At certain times of the day, specifically, they would affect me more like earlier on in the day or sort of afternoon time. Um, I wouldn't say I've been exposed to lights so much, but I already feel like that's improved from like, the, you know, the bright airport lights and I've got a ring light on at, at the moment over to my right hand side. Sounds as well. Again, I just feel that's improved. I feel like I can handle more that comes at me. Chest pain, which is sort of with the breathing difficulties as well. Just another thing I haven't noticed as much at all, really. Um, Maybe if I'm out walking a little bit more, I'll start to feel it, like, I, you know, my neck and my chest and my lower back. Um, but other than that, I was getting them very frequently previously, and, and now they feel like they've relieved to, you know, they've, they've left me to sort of quite a large degree. Um, and finally, I've written here achy joints, neck pain and back pain, which links into what I just said. Um, just another thing that I, I feel like I'm getting, but I'm getting them in relation to doing more when I push my body more which is what I spoke about with Dr Kaiser it's like you need to go in search to sort of almost face your symptoms you need to like want to welcome them back in by pushing that boat out a bit more by doing a bit more and as a result what you'll do is you'll sort of push this marker further further forward so you can sort of expand what you can do within a day and you don't have to live in such a narrow window of you know all the things you can do so yeah that's the symptoms guys um they're the ones i could think about they're the ones that i listed i'm sure there's plenty more but i hope you sort of get the idea from that that it isn't just that i might have had a, di a diagnosis or a few diagnoses a few years ago that sort of you know explains what i actually felt like every day it's just really like a myriad of symptoms and they're all at one they all they happened every single moment pretty much of every single day for over seven years and it just completely consumed me and it completely ruled my life and that's why i'm so grateful to have experienced what i have done and really come out the other end with pretty much improvement in every single one of those bullet points i just read out to you um, and it's amazing when you can identify that area of the body where all of these systems meet and you can work on training that and actually find the dysfunction there and improve it and rehabilitate it just amazing things can come as a result of it. So I thought a nice way to end this video would be for me to read out my top five takeaways from this whole experience, working with the team in Chelsea, Michigan, also before the things I'd learned through complex reading complex literature, and also just the things I've learned about functional neurology and how doing something has offered me such an alleviation of so many symptoms and what it really takes to get there. So I'm gonna read out these five points of my biggest takeaways from this whole journey. So firstly, living like a normal, fit, healthy human being requires thousands of complex actions per day. If your body struggles with the fundamentals and doesn't run efficiently at the most basic level, meaning, for example, it can't respond properly to standing up, or you know, it can't talk, it can't breathe properly, it can't digest food properly, then it's not surprising why it doesn't offer you the resources to be able to handle what other people can. Stability must come first. The second point is that recovery is active. The only way to become a more able human is to become stronger. Facing symptoms on the pathway to recovery is a necessity. Recovery isn't linear. You will have things blocking your way, You'll have moments where you go up, take two steps forward, one step back. It's just what happens during the recovery process. And it is hard work. The third point is that changes in neural networks can come about instantaneously. If we're able to identify the central point where all the symptomatic systems meet 
and diagnose that dysfunction via functional neurologic testing, then we can work on optimizing that part of the brain or nervous system, bring it back to its original state, and this in turn should cause multiple symptoms to improve in tandem, so improve alongside one another, if we can really identify that point where all these systems meet that central point, that control center. Point number four, all the pieces to the puzzle might already be there. We just might have to approach the problem from a different perspective to correctly rearrange them to allow the body to work as it was intended to do, as it was built to do. My significant improvement from this process taught me that introducing new things into the body isn't necessarily the answer for long-term changes to occur in the body. And my final point is that Despite spending thousands of hours researching and reading complex literature, I couldn't have gone at this process alone. I couldn't have made this progress on my own. I needed those professionals who were more knowledgeable and qualified than me to carry out their assessment and monitor my rehabilitation while giving me, while giving me these tailored and specific exercises to my own case based on the findings that they came across. So all that leads me to say is thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate if you've taken the time to watch this whole video and I really hope it taught you some important lessons about what might be going wrong with the body and just hopefully you've observed the change in me from the first video I made to this last one. And yeah, I just really appreciate this whole process. I'm so grateful for the team over in Chelsea, Michigan. And yeah, just thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure to record this, to document this. And I really hope this video will change you for the better.